What's up everyone and welcome back to another what if video. This what if has been suggested by a lot of people in the comments. At first, I was thinking that it wouldn't be too important, but after running through it with some friends, we were able to find out that the scenario actually has a lot of potential when you look into it. You'll see what I mean as it goes on, but as you can tell from the title, today we'll be looking at what might have happened if Roshi was to be young again. Let's begin. For the starting point of the scenario, we'll start off at the end of the 23rd World Tournament, where things are pretty normal so far. Goku defeats Piccolo Jr., and then goes off to live his life with Chi-Chi, his new fiancé, and all is well in life. With not much going on during this time, Roshi is a bit bored. Goku is off with his own wife starting a family, while Roshi's only company is Krillin, and he doesn't really have much going on with him either. But over this time, Roshi then hatches a scheme, and disguises it as an idea. It should make things a little bit more interesting for him in his life. He brings it up to Krillin one day, remembering how King Piccolo wished for his youth and it made him stronger, Roshi wonders if the same could happen for him. That way, maybe he could train Krillin more effectively, and they wouldn't be as bored. Plus, it would make him a lot more effective in battles if they needed. Krillin actually thinks that this is a great idea, not just for Roshi, but for everyone around him. But really, Roshi does have an ulterior motive. Being the kind of guy he is, he really just wants to wish for his youth so he could be more of a ladies' man. I mean, just think of the guy that Roshi is. He's kind of an ultra simp, so this kind of falls in line with his character. Being old isn't really doing him any favors in terms of woman, but in his mind, being young again might give him a better shot with the ladies. But yeah, getting stronger is a plus. He and Krillin consult Bulma, and they get the Dragon Radar, and search for the Dragon Balls. The two of them are able to gather them in no time, since it's a time of peace right now and there's no one really to interrupt. Roshi thanks Krillin for his help, feeling kinda bad that he wasn't 100% truthful with Krillin, but it doesn't matter since Krillin can come along with him on his journey to find girls. Roshi summons Shenron, and then he makes his wish. He wishes to be young again, back in his prime. Shenron works his magic, and then he grants the wish. And before Krillin's eyes, he sees Master Roshi completely change. His beard starts to disappear, and his hair begins to grow back. The wrinkles go away, and Roshi even grows taller, and his scrawny body turns into a more fit and lean one. Roshi is once again young, in his prime. Technically, he's still 326 years old right now, but let's say he's now the same age as Krillin in terms of his body. He's in the body of a 20-year-old right now. He's immediately elated, and Krillin is pretty amazed as well. And yeah, he is more powerful. Roshi, in order to celebrate, shows his true colors, and he tells Krillin that they should go and find some hot girls to celebrate with. Krillin is a little suspicious that Roshi might have only just become young to do this, but he doesn't question it. It should be fun, and I mean, that is something Krillin would probably want to have fun with anyways. Roshi and Krillin party away for a bit, enjoying themselves. But that's not all their life is comprised of, so they're going to be back at Kame House eventually. In this new body, or I guess his former body, Roshi decides to test it out with some training. So he and Krillin begin. Roshi is actually pretty amazed at how strong he is. I mean, he doesn't even realize the extent of his power now, and at first it's hard to control it because he didn't expect it to be that strong. He actually begins to have a lot of fun with it. Over the next few years, he and Krillin begin to do a lot more training than before, meaning both Roshi and Krillin become stronger. By the time power levels come into play, Krillin and Roshi were at 206 and 139 respectively. However, now that he's had more training and with a better partner, Krillin's power is actually at 260, meaning he's even stronger than Tien at this point. And surprisingly, Roshi is really strong before and after the training. I mean, judging by what happened with King Piccolo, they assumed this would happen, and much like what did happen with Piccolo, becoming younger made him stronger. Plus, he's had a few years of training, so he's even stronger than that. With all that taken into account, I'm going to say his power level has increased by about two and a half times from where it was before, placing him at a whopping 350. That makes him almost as strong as Piccolo was without weights, and when Piccolo has his weighted clothing on, Roshi's actually a bit stronger than him. By the time the time skip ends, Roshi is the strongest human at this point besides Goku, because, well, they still think that Goku is a human. But as we know, that's not true, and things are about to change. We now enter the Saiyan Saga. After time passes, a reunion is planned at Kame House. Back when they returned the Dragon Radar to her, Bulma already saw Roshi in his new body, and she knows that he made the wish, so she's not actually too surprised to see him. But it seems like life has been going pretty well now that Roshi is young, and after she catches up with everyone for a bit, they then go outside to see that they have another visitor on the island. And of course, the person that just arrived is Goku, and he's holding a child for some reason. Everyone is equally confused, not knowing who that kid is, while Goku is just as confused as to who this black-haired man is. On top of being confused, everyone also becomes equally shocked, 
learning that this kid, Gohan, is actually Goku's son. While Goku is amazed to find out that that strong guy is actually a young version of Master Roshi. Pretty interesting reunion so far. However, this brief reunion gets cut short. Far away, like normal, Raditz has landed on Earth, and has been scoping out Kakarot, checking his scouter. He sees the high power level, and he first encounters Piccolo, but then he notices a concentration of three high power levels on a scouter far away, and he heads to where those power levels are. He arrives on the island and makes himself known, explaining who he is and why he's here. Krillin confronts this Raditz guy, only to get smacked into the side of the house by his tail. He's alright though, he doesn't take as much damage this time. Everyone realizes that this guy means business. He then takes Gohan, to which Goku and Roshi try to fight him, but they both get taken out by a few hits from Raditz. Angered, Goku calls Nimbus to his location, about to fly out, followed by Piccolo appearing on the island. Piccolo creates a temporary alliance with Goku, as Roshi and Krillin decide to come along as well, and they'll take a flying car and follow Goku and Piccolo out to wherever Raditz is. The four of them end up heading out, and eventually, they arrive to where Raditz and Gohan are, noticing that Gohan is in a space pod nearby. They already know that this Raditz guy is pretty strong, so they gotta be careful here. However, while Raditz might be stronger by himself, they have an advantage in terms of numbers. The four of them end up charging Raditz, and the fight begins. Raditz is actually able to hold them off pretty well, but they're able to also somewhat hold their own against him. Raditz seems to fight more with brute force, while Goku and his group actually fight more with skill and technique. But this isn't something that Raditz hasn't encountered before. I'm sure with his experience, he's probably had to fight multiple people at once before. Really though, the surprising thing for him is that everyone is so strong. After a brief battle, both sides take a moment to catch their breath. Alongside everyone else, Piccolo then tries to come up with a plan. He has a new technique called the Special Beam Cannon, which he wants to try out on Raditz. It might actually help kill him. The only issue though is that he needs to charge it up, so they'll need to distract Raditz for a bit and actually hold him down once the time comes to actually launch the beam. Goku, Roshi, and Krillin agree, and the four of them go back to attack Raditz, with Piccolo eventually leaving when Raditz doesn't notice. However, now that it's only a 3-on-1, they begin taking a lot more damage from Raditz. From the space pod, Gohan can still see this happening, and he gets really angry from it. Temporarily, Raditz notices a huge power level on his scouter, and then before he even knows it, he gets headbutted in the chest by Gohan. Gohan's rage boost has finally been shown off, much to the shock of everyone there. With Raditz briefly stunned from this blast and trying to recollect himself, this is a perfect opportunity. Goku jumps out and grabs Raditz's tail, knowing that it's a weak point for him. Raditz is now completely immobilized, and then he begins to think to himself, where did the Namekian go? And then, in the distance, he sees. Piccolo is over there, charging his special beam cannon. Raditz begs for Goku to let him go pleading for his life and beginning to tell Goku that he actually changed his ways if he lets him go. But with Krillin and Roshi there, they tell Goku to not do it. They realize that this guy's bluffing, and they don't want him to take advantage of Goku's kind nature. Goku listens to his friends, assuming that they have better judgment than him, so he holds on to Raditz's tail. Raditz tries to wiggle himself out, but he can't escape. As a last resort, he only sees one option, knowing that he'll die if he doesn't do this. He proceeds to cut his own tail off with a key blast. This frees him from Goku, but now he can't turn into a great ape if he ever needed to. And Raditz once again is ready to fight, but before he could charge towards the group, he then feels a jolt of energy run through him. And I don't mean his key is increasing, no, he's getting electrocuted right now. Goku turns over and he sees Roshi and Krillin standing there, both using the Thundershock surprise technique that Roshi once used on Goku. Both of them combined, putting out their full power, are actually able to hold Raditz off with this attack, electrocuting him and this quite literally keeps him paralyzed. Huh, I guess Goku kinda missed out on some cool training with Roshi. This is one of the many techniques Krillin has been able to pick up with his training from Roshi, but that's besides the point right now. They yell for Piccolo to hurry up, since they can't really hold this much longer, and Raditz is beginning to resist a bit and actually break free. Even with the two of them at full power using this technique, it's only barely enough to hold him back, and at best all it's really doing right now is slowing him down. Piccolo then finally charges his beam to its full capacity, and he fires it towards Raditz. Raditz is just about to escape from the Thundershock surprise, but then, he's completely weakened once he feels a beam pierce through his chest. The Special Beam Cannon has successfully hit him, and it swirls off into the sky, leaving a gaping hole in Raditz's chest. Catching their breath, Krillin and Roshi fall on their knees and collapse with Goku running over to them, thanking them for their help, and Piccolo doing kind of the same. They all go up towards Raditz, and make sure that the deed is actually done. Goku can't help but look down with pity, he didn't really want it to end this way with his own brother, 
but there was nothing really he could do. In his last few breaths, Raditz gives the group a warning. The Saiyans will be here in due time, coming to avenge him and kill Kakarot once and for all. With his last warning, Raditz then dies on the ground in front of them. While it's good that they achieved this victory over Raditz, they can't say the same for the other Saiyans. From what they heard from Raditz, they'll be here in a year, and they're actually way stronger than he is, so they don't really know what they're going to do then. Bulma then arrives over and sees that everything is okay, well, at least not for Raditz, and that they were actually able to defeat this guy. Piccolo then butts in and says something. If these other strong Saiyans are going to come to Earth, then they need to train for it. And since he sees that Goku hasn't really trained his son well, Piccolo then is about to take Gohan for himself to train him. But with Goku there, he obviously goes against this idea, and says that he would train him himself. But instead of that, Roshi actually butts in. Since he's much stronger now, and his training with Krillin was actually really effective, Roshi tells Goku that he can actually train Gohan instead. Goku actually considers this, and remembering how strong he was after training with Roshi when he was a kid, I mean Goku obviously knows that Roshi is a good man for the job, and seeing how strong Krillin has gotten over the last few years, it makes sense. I mean obviously he wasn't going to send him with Piccolo anyways, but as for Goku, he wouldn't really be as good of a teacher as Roshi would be. I mean, Goku would be a good teacher, but Roshi is one of the few people that taught Goku everything he knows, so Roshi might be a better option, especially since Goku knows that he could train kids, since Goku doesn't really know where to start with Gohan. Goku graciously accepts the offer, with Piccolo at least glad that they're actually taking this seriously. He's going to go off by himself and train. He doesn't really want to train with these people. But on his own, Piccolo will become stronger. Their temporary alliance gets extended, since it is kind of an enemy of an enemy is my friend situation. So Piccolo has to team up with these guys for a little bit longer just so they can defeat the Saiyans, and then he can go back to his evil ways. But this does mean that Goku has to consult Chi Chi about it. So Goku does return back home and tells her about what happened. And at first she's completely against it. But when she hears what Raditz said to her son, she's actually all for Gohan learning to defend himself here, as long as Goku's there training with him. It does take some convincing, but since Goku's gonna be there with him, the Earth is at stake, and because she's kinda pissed off about Raditz kidnapping Gohan, yeah, she accepts it eventually. With the approval from Chi-Chi, Goku and Gohan head off to Kame House, back to see Roshi again, where they'll be training with Roshi and Krillin. At the end of the last part, I mentioned how Roshi wanted to actually train Gohan, after his rage boost was shown in action against Raditz, they began to realize that Gohan has a lot of potential built up inside of him that can make him a potentially really strong fighter. And of course, Piccolo did want to train him, but with Goku around, that's not going to happen. Goku himself could train Gohan, but Roshi would be better suited for this because he is a teacher and he did show Goku most of what he knows. They know he has a good track record with training people, so Roshi is a solid choice to actually train Gohan. With this now decided, training commences. Gohan arrives at Kame House with Goku and Krillin. And after Goku got some approval from Chi Chi, Gohan is now ready to begin his training. He's pretty young right now, only four. So Piccolo's harsh training wouldn't really help ease him into fighting that much. Or so they assume. But what they do know for sure is that this training will be better suited for him. It's a lot less harsh for whatever Piccolo had in store. And they know for a fact that it will be effective. I mean, it worked on Krillin and Goku, so why not Gohan as well? Roshi spends most of his time training with Krillin and Gohan, and Goku is also there for the most part, except sometimes he does sneak off to try and train with Piccolo, since Piccolo is a pretty strong guy and he doesn't want to let that go to waste. It's like an all-you-can-eat buffet of training partners. So Goku's going to take a little bit of everything, but he mainly does stick with Roshi, Gohan, and Krillin. And of course this means no King Kai either. Goku's not dead, so he won't be going to King Kai to learn the Spear Bomb or Kaioken. This is also kind of a good thing, because instead of spending a lot of time on Snake Way running, He'll have all this time spent training rather than running for most of the time, which meant he only got a few months of training on King Kai's planet. Roshi is aware of Gohan's latent potential. He did train Goku after all, and especially after what he saw during the fight with Raditz, he's interested in training this kid. He wonders though, how much of that potential can he draw out? That temporary rage boost that he showed off when he attacked Raditz, that alone was surprisingly enough to injure the Saiyan. So imagine if he could draw that out from Gohan, and then some. It'll be interesting to see. Gohan is a bit nervous at first, but the environment is a lot friendlier, plus Goku's there. And the training isn't harsh at all, when compared to Piccolo's. Rather than him being dropped in the middle of nowhere, he's on an island with some guys that are really nice to him and his dad, so he knows he's in good hands. They begin to ease him into the training, and they start out by giving him similar training to what Goku and Krillin has as kids. And just to avoid any potential disasters, they remove his tail beforehand. They don't want to see any great apes around here. This training is also very good for Roshi, Krillin, and Goku. They get much stronger as well, but Roshi? 
he gets more reinvigorated and motivated from this training, he truly begins to feel young again. Whenever he has free time where Gohan's out doing some training, Roshi begins challenging himself and his students way more, trying to see what he's capable of now that he's young again. They practice different techniques, do harsher training, and overall see very good gains. And instead of being on his own with Goku occasionally visiting, Piccolo decides to stop by sometimes and swallows his pride in order to get some more training experience. He's not seeing many gains on his own, so it would be better to train with these guys. As for the other humans, they're training with Kami and each other on the lookout, trying to get to a higher level before they join Roshi in his more intense training. They see some pretty good gains as well. A few months before the Saiyans arrive, training begins to ramp up. Gohan is a natural at his training, and he's been making very good progress. Goku and Roshi are very impressed, and that potential they saw in him seemed to be accurate. He's grown much stronger than he was before, which is crazy because he's barely 5 years old. Gohan was trained a lot better than he was with Piccolo, and he was trained like Goku was, and he's not scared of a fight anymore, and he knows his own strengths and weaknesses. He was able to pick up on martial arts pretty easily, and learn some different techniques. Not just from Roshi either, of course he does have the Kamehameha, but he learned some from Goku and Krillin as well, and of course some others from Roshi. You know, he's picked up some pretty useful techniques such as the Solar Flare, the Thundershock Surprise, and even the Destructo Disc, which Goku and Roshi have as well. This training not only is good for their powers to increase, but it expands their array of techniques, and now they have a much more versatile range of things to use in battle. And I'll just say this now, Roshi does learn how to fly here. I don't know why we ever saw him learn that in canon, but why not? Goku and Krillin have it, and Gohan does, and of course Roshi's a lot younger here and a lot stronger. I always felt he should have been able to do that in the first place anyways, but we've never seen him do that. But here, yeah, he's going to be able to do that. With training ramping up, Gohan even starts to do more intense training with everyone else, but he of course has to get eased into it first. And the humans begin joining as well. It's basically like a party, a bunch of people training to be the best they can be. With the one year nearing its end, let's actually talk about their power levels right now, since that's kind of relevant at this part in the story. Goku's at the top, with a power level of about 6,000. You might think that's kind of high, because with King Kai, he got to about over 8,000. Not including the Kaioken. But you gotta remember, a lot of his time was spent on Snake Way, and he only did about 3 months of training with King Kai. Here, he's done a full 12 months of training with good partners. And given his natural potential as a Saiyan and his Zenkais, I think this is a good place to put him. He's a little bit weaker than he was originally, but it's still very good, even without Kaioken. Piccolo's at 4,500, close behind with Roshi at 3,500 surprisingly, being the third strongest. Behind him is Krillin at 3,200. With Tien reaching 3,000, Gohan actually reaching 2,600, which is about double where he was in the original story. Yamcha at 2,200, and Chaozu even gets to 1,000, which is pretty insane. There's more training partners on Earth, because Roshi and Goku are there too, and Piccolo's free now without having to teach Gohan. So the humans have three more effective training partners, all of whom are stronger than them, so they all see some very big improvements. And it's good that they improve this much, because now the one year has passed, and the time to fight is here. They're able to find the two Saiyans, a large one named Nappa, and a shorter one named Vegeta, who is apparently the prince. And they're ready to fight. As an appetizer, the Cybermen are sent out by Vegeta and Nappa. And this time, they're taken out pretty easily. Yamcha doesn't even die here. He's a lot more careful, and everyone's way stronger than the Cybermen except maybe Chaozu, but even he's close to the power of just one of them. So the Cybermen aren't really a big deal. Interesting, it seems that the Earthlings are actually a lot stronger than they thought. But those are just Cybermen, they're weaklings. Nappa's gonna be the real deal, so Nappa's sent out to fight them. Or so they think. Nappa does hold his own for a bit, but then begins losing ground really quick once the pace starts picking up. He doesn't even try to fight the others, he's mainly focused on Kakarot right now. Which is kind of a big mistake because Goku's the strongest of the group, and he's stronger than Nappa. Getting kinda pissed off, he tries to distract Goku by throwing an attack at Gohan, who doesn't know what to do. He thinks quickly and jumps out of the way, and doesn't know how to counter the attack, so he just fires a Destructo Disc at random, hoping that it'll be enough to cut the attack in half. This creates some irony though, because the Destructo Disc ends up hitting Nappa's arm, and slicing it clean off. You know, kinda like Nappa did when he fought Tien. Gohan's actually pretty shocked at his power, even though that attack is a really strong one. But he's surprised that his self-defense actually worked, it diverts the attack, and sends Nappa screaming. Nappa's still sorta okay, but he's even more pissed off now, and charges towards the group. In preparation, Gohan, Roshi, and Krillin all fire a Kamehameha, with Goku joining in as Nappa flies back towards him, a turtle school Kamehameha if you will. This launches Nappa up into the air, 
and he falls back to the ground, knocked out. Vegeta feels a mix of disappointment, shock, and embarrassment, and all these emotions cause him to just kill Nappa. If he couldn't handle an attack like that, well he's not really of any use. He's just a weakling who can't even take on a low class warrior like Kakarot. Vegeta's kind of impressed though with the group. He thought this would just be a slaughter fest, but this might actually make it interesting for him. Instead of casually flicking his wrist and killing everyone, he might actually have to try a bit, which is kind of fun. Vegeta is tough to take on, and he begins to launch towards the group. While Vegeta is stronger than any of them individually, they not only have a higher collective power, but they have strength in numbers. I mean, you have over half a dozen fighters facing Vegeta, and they're able to actually hold him back pretty well. But they won't be able to do any considerable damage unless they all find an opening to attack together. Roshi is also very keen to pick up on this, and is waiting for an opening. He has a specific attack that he wants to use that he knows will work for sure, but for now, he's fighting like normal like everyone else. He even breaks out an old technique that he hasn't really used much, his max power form, which makes him slower, but it does make him stronger. We don't know the exact multiplier for this, but I'm just gonna say it gives him about a one and a half times boost in power. Not too much, but not too little, except he's slower. Vegeta realizes that he's not getting anywhere with this fight, and they're holding against him pretty well. So he tries a last ditch attack and throws a power ball in the sky. This cuts his power dramatically, but it means he could transform into a great ape. He looks up at it, and he begins to grow. He gets larger and larger, and then suddenly, he feels a sharp pain and goes back to normal size before he can transform. He turns around and sees that his tail has been cut off by Krillin who threw a destructo disc. It was some quick and smart thinking on his part, and it prevented the transformation from happening. Vegeta is a little bit weaker now because he used the power ball, but he's still able to fight, and he's pissed off now. He's succumbing to his anger, and he begins launching a major attack and getting sloppy. And this seems like a shot for Roshi to use his attack. He would have done this to Vegeta while facing Nappa, but he couldn't, because he had another giant Saiyan to take on in front of him. But now with no Nappa and Vegeta distracted, this is a good opportunity, where Vegeta is alone and kinda stationary. Roshi throws down a small bottle that he had with him, and when it's too late, Vegeta looks over and sees Roshi performing an attack, the Mafuba. Everyone looks over in surprise and sees what's happening, as Vegeta is lifted into the air and then placed in that container. Roshi quickly seals it up, and holds it down, then placing a seal on it. Yup, they actually have a seal, unlike a certain someone who forgot it. Oh, well, in the manga, I guess it was Roshi's fault, but that's besides the point. Point is, they seal him unlike they did to Zamasu. Is it actually over? It was that easy? They're a little beat up, but everyone's pretty much okay. Well, except Nappa, who's dead on the ground without an arm and Vegeta who's now inside a small bottle. They actually defeated the Saiyans. That went pretty smoothly. They all celebrate, and Roshi takes the small bottle that he has to Kami, who's gonna dispose of it somehow or store it away somewhere. It needs to be somewhere safe so that Vegeta doesn't escape. It's funny too because Goku probably wouldn't have even wanted to kill them anyways. This way, they're dealt with and he didn't have to do any of the dirty work. So this leads to something interesting. Without all the deaths, there's not gonna be any Namek arc. Remember from the last part, Raditz never heard about the Dragon Balls, which means by extension, Nappa and Vegeta never did. And then by more extension, that means Frieza never did. So he's not gonna go to Namek either. The Dragon Team doesn't even need to because, well, no one's dead. And they still have Dragon Balls on Earth. So Namek stays safe. And for the time being, Earth is pretty peaceful. That was pretty eventful, but now they could return back to their normal lives. Well, at least they think so. This is Dragon Ball after all. There's gonna be a new villain eventually. But for the time being at least, everything's good. Everyone's alive, Yamcha even tries to patch things up with the Bulma, Krillin and Roshi keep up with their training, Goku's with his family, and Gohan's even kinda motivated to train because he had fun with Roshi, and he does so in his free time with Goku, as well as Master Roshi and Krillin sometimes, well at least when Chi-Chi allows it. Hell, with all the peace going on, Goku and Chi-Chi even decide to have another kid, so you can expect Goten to show up pretty soon, a lot sooner than normal. But like I said, it's not gonna be this peaceful for long. There's going to be a certain visitor from the future soon, as well as some new enemies, but when that happens and who that is, we'll have to wait until the next part to find that out. With the Earth saved, life goes on like normal. This peacetime means a few things happen in terms of families. For one, Goku and Chi-Chi have another kid earlier, with him of course being named Goten. And as for Bulma and Yamcha, if you remember in the last part I also had them together. And after some time passes around age 764, they actually have a kid named Trunks, but it isn't the Trunks that you're thinking of. I mean, I guess he technically is, but since Yamcha's his father, he's fully human and he's going to be completely different once he's grown up. So really, he's just Trunks in name only. And everyone's family lives seem to be going pretty well. No alien invaders have come to Earth and everything's been going pretty smoothly. However, 
A new character shows up in Age 764. Actually, I lied, it's three people. Each member of the Dragon Team senses three new key signatures nearby, and they decide to head to where it is to see what's going on. They can't tell who these signatures belong to, but they seem oddly familiar. But they don't really know why it seems familiar. Funny enough, those key signatures were also searching for Goku, so it makes it easier that he came to them. The team arrives and they see three people there. They look weirdly familiar, and for a good reason. They decide to introduce themselves, Gohan, Goten, and Trunks. Wait, what? Like, those two babies? And Gohan? Why are they old? They obviously aren't lying because they look so similar, but how come there's an older version of each of these three? Simple, they're from the future. So normally in my videos, I like to keep Trunks' timeline the same, and I usually wouldn't change up anything. However, for this what if, I feel like it would be more interesting if I did it where I did change the future. A timeline in which all the events of this story happened. So let's give a brief recap of the future timeline. Around age 766 like normal, Goku gets the heart virus and then ends up dying. Due to it being of natural causes, he can't be revived, so he's gone for good. This all around shocks everyone, and it creates a pretty bad situation for the Sun family, since now Gohan and Goten don't have Goku around. Especially with Goten being so young, Roshi decides that he kinda wants to help out the Sun family. Gohan is his student after all, and he wants to honor Goku, his former student. After all the things Goku has done for everyone else, this is the least he can do. Without Goku around, Gohan's master Roshi and his uncle Krillin basically act as his only father figures being there for the family whenever they need, and also training Gohan still, even though he's kind of keeping up with the studies now. They form a much closer bond than before. If things weren't bad enough, they're about to get worse. Around age 767, the androids end up appearing. So you're probably thinking right now, okay, everyone's dead, there's no way they're gonna survive the androids. Well, there is a chance. Since everyone would be much weaker than the normal timeline in canon, the androids would have the data of those people, not the canon characters. So yeah, they're much stronger than the Dragon Team, but they're proportionate to the amount of strength that the androids had in comparison to the regular Dragon Team in canon. Since that's a little confusing, here's a little example. Just throwing out a random number, let's say the androids are 100 times stronger than Super Saiyan Goku in canon. So here they'd be 100 times stronger than Goku in here. That's not an actual number by the way, I'm just using it for example's sake. So they're still strong, but in proportion to how strong they were in comparison to the regular Dragon Team which means there would still be a shot at survivability, and that's what happens to a few of the people. One of the worst days in particular comes when they're fighting the androids. The entire dragon team is there trying to face off against them and trying to defeat them. This does not go as well as they thought though. Pretty much all the dragon team dies. Yamcha, Tenshinhan, Piccolo, with some of the last fighters being Roshi, Krillin, and Gohan. The androids make their final charge, attempting to kill the last three survivors. They know no one stands a chance, but they can at least try and save someone. Apologizing for having to hurt his student, Roshi grabs Gohan and flings him out of the way, causing him and Krillin to take the blast head on. The androids think their work is done here. They killed everyone, and they think that Gohan's dead. So with this success, they make their leave. Gohan was knocked unconscious temporarily, but overall he's pretty fine. He goes over to see the destruction that happened and what happened while he was unconscious. And this is where every last bit of hope shatters for him. First, his father died from the heart virus. Then the androids killed his friends and training partners, Tenshinhan, Piccolo, and Yamcha, and the final straw to break the camel's back, his uncle Krillin and his master Roshi, who not only died, but died sacrificing themselves to save Gohan. All the frustration and sadness finally gets to Gohan. It boils up inside him and then eventually bursts. His key dramatically rises, and an odd sensation comes over him. He screams, and after a brief explosion of power, something changes in him. He's surrounded by a gold aura, and he feels stronger. Caught up in his rage and sadness, he doesn't even realize it at first, but then he notices he had some sort of physical change. In the broken glass of one of the buildings nearby, he looks at the glass and sees his reflection. His eyes are blue, his hair is gold. He barely recognizes himself. On top of all the emotion he felt before, he's terrified now because he doesn't know what's happened to him. He's become a Super Saiyan, but he doesn't know it. Because in this scenario, no one's become a Super Saiyan before him and he hasn't even heard about it. He's actually the first Super Saiyan. So understandably, he's heavily confused and doesn't know what happened to him. And while he's scared about the transformation, he senses the power that it causes inside of him. He feels strong. He heads back home to deliver the news of what happened. And he tries to maintain whatever technique this is, but due to all the fatigue from battle, he eventually ends up losing it. Sadly, he has to deliver the news to everyone that all the Dragon Team has died, which includes telling Bulma that her husband is dead. And with no Piccolo, there's no Kami and no Dragon Balls either. But even with all the darkness from that situation, with Gohan thinking that everything was lost, there is a bit of hope. Whatever golden-haired form he had, 
He wants to see if he can try and emulate it again and obtain it, remembering the sensation and seeing if he can try and copy it again. Maybe that's the key to defeating the androids. Life goes on over the next few years while the androids rampage. The only survivors are Gohan, Goten, Trunks, Chi Chi, and Bulma. Well, if we're going by Super, I guess Yajirobe too, but he's gonna hide out like normal. Anyways, time keeps going on and eventually the three kids grow up. Gohan does end up accessing this form. Not knowing that it's Super Saiyan, he just calls it Super Gohan because he doesn't know what else to refer to it as. Just a form that makes him Super, and might even be exclusive to him for all he knows. Over this time period, he begins training Goten, who's heard stories about his father, and knows that his brother is a fighter, and he wants to try and be like him. Of course, Gohan will train him, teaching him everything he learned from Goku, Krillin, and Roshi. Sadly, he wasn't blessed with BS Saiyan genes, but Trunks does want to help. They don't even really know how vast the difference is between humans and Saiyans, but even if they did, Trunks willing to help would be welcomed. Bulma doesn't really want her son to become a fighter and lose him alongside Yamcha, but she can't stop it and Trunks does end up training with Gohan and Goten. No one really knows what to do against the androids, they get a lot stronger over this time period, but they don't know if it's enough. They're gonna keep training, but Gohan's not really wholly confident that they're gonna end up being able to do it. As a failsafe, Bulma starts working on some projects to travel back in time to see if that will help alleviate the situation. So she starts working on the time machine a bit earlier. With all this still happening, Gohan decides to try and train Goten and Trunks. He thinks through every possible theory and where this transformation could have come from, and he comes up with a few possibilities, the least likely of which is that this is a human form, which he could access since he's half human. The two other scenarios are more likely. It could either be a form exclusive to hybrid Saiyans or just Saiyans in general and in that case it would make sense since he was the first one to ever do it, otherwise he probably would have heard about it before. So maybe, just maybe, he can't get Trunks to learn this form, but Goten probably can learn it himself. While he trains the two of them, he begins trying to see if Goten can do it himself, but he can't really find a way for him to do it. Gohan himself barely knows how the form works, he can only really use it himself, and the most he can do is really just describe the sensation of transforming into one, and how he did so out of anger and sadness. Kinda like with Future Trunks in the main story, this doesn't really work and Goten isn't able to access it at first. More time passes and even with all their training, there's still no match for the androids. We eventually arrive to around age 781. Bulma started working on the time machine earlier on, and now she's finished with it. They decide, why not, and try and head back in time to see if that will help solve the situation. The plan is to head back with a cure for Goku's heart virus, as well as warning them about the androids in the future. Also, while they're there, they can ask everyone about this form that Gohan has and see if they could find out any more about it. While it does seem kinda crazy, they kinda wanna go release Vegeta in the past too. They would've done so here so they could have an extra fighter and possibly find out an explanation for the form that Gohan has, but since Kami died, they have no way of finding where Vegeta's capsule is. So he is still sealed away somewhere in the future, but no one knows where. He's probably their best source of information, if not using Shenron. With the preparation set, the three of them step into the time machine and then head back to the past timeline. Just to simplify everything a little bit, here's the two timelines side by side with each respective age for when the events happened. Age 763, Goten was born, and with age 764, Trunks was born, and this is when the future warriors show up in the present timeline, three years before the androids arrive. In the future timeline, everything is the same up until age 766 when Goku dies pretty much like normal, and in age 767, the androids appear right after. A lot of time passes in between, and age 781 is when the time machine is finished, and when they all head back in time. This comparison of the two timelines can help clear things up a little bit, if it was confusing to any of you. And now we come to where this would have started off, with all of them introducing themselves. There's no need to keep their identity secret since they're all born by this time. So they explain who they are and why they're here. Everyone is understandably confused and amazed at the same time from what they've been told. Goku succumbing to some heart virus is bad enough, but eventually some androids are gonna show up, and now these three kids from the future survive and they head back here, and Gohan has some golden hair form? They obviously have a lot of questions. And Gohan decides to ask a question that really doesn't sit well with too many people. He wants to know if they could release Vegeta, which seems like a really bad idea, but he has a reasoning behind it. He wants to learn about whatever golden hair form he has because he assumes it's something sane exclusive. And Vegeta potentially could provide some insight into it. And they don't know that the two timelines are separate, but they assume that somehow Goku can access this form too, and pass Gohan, well, maybe it'll save their future, but as we know, the timelines are separate, so that won't change anything. However, it could help future Goten access it, too. They're hesitant, but they're 100% sure that this is actually Gohan, Goten, and Trunks from the future. I mean, it's especially easy to tell for Gohan since the present Gohan's right here, and Goku could recognize that these are actually his two sons. So he trusts them in their judgment, 
and they're not too scared of releasing Vegeta because they're strong enough to defeat him if need be. They go to Kami, and Kami's the only one who actually knows where Vegeta was taken. His container wasn't destroyed, but rather buried somewhere safe. Luckily, Kami's been listening in, so they don't need to explain why they want to dig up Vegeta and release him. Although he is still kind of wary of it. They find the container that has Vegeta in it, and they finally do it. They release Vegeta from his containment. Vegeta is sitting there, catching his breath, not knowing what just happened. He looks around him and recognizes who these people are. They were those people he was fighting earlier on before he got sealed away. He doesn't even know how long it's been, he's just been stuck inside that container for years. If he weren't so confused, he'd be livid enough to just blow up Earth right now. Even if that were to kill him too. Vegeta does attempt to fight everyone, but they're so strong at this point in comparison to him that he can't do any damage. He even tries to attack some of the weaker ones like Yamcha, and Yamcha just blocks Vegeta's punch with one finger. Even this guy is stronger than the Prince of All Saiyans? He's pissed. He demands to know what happened to him, why everyone's so strong now, and why he's been released from this containment in the first place. And also, who are those three other fighters that he doesn't recognize from before? To shut Vegeta up, Gohan instantly turns Super Saiyan, and Vegeta looks at him speechless. While he hasn't seen him before, he's heard the legends. And once he finds out that this is Gohan, he knows for sure. This is it. A Super Saiyan. Vegeta is angered, but also somewhat amazed that there's actually a Super Saiyan here. And he completely forgets all that anger he had before. Partially out of fear, but also because he has an idea now. But he doesn't ask yet and decides to just explain to everyone what happened to Gohan. They learn what little Vegeta knows about Super Saiyan. Basically what he's heard from legends about how warriors got strong enough to become one. But he didn't think it would actually happen. Especially with a half-breed instead of a pure Saiyan. Vegeta is still furious, but with the offering of Super Saiyan now, he's warmed up somewhat to talking to the group rationally. He could settle the score with them later. And with everyone caught up, the group now has an option. They're definitely going to try and learn Super Saiyan for themselves, which includes future Goten. But they come up with the idea of potentially just destroying the androids before they even arrive. However, they get another proposal from Vegeta. He will offer his full alliance to everyone if they help him with something. Defeating Frieza. Wait, who's Frieza? In case you couldn't tell, Frieza never showed up in the future timeline because there was no reason for him to, and Vegeta's only now just bringing him up. He describes who Frieza is and what he's done, and they're not particularly sure if they want to go help and defeat him, at least not right now when the androids are a priority. So in the last part, I end off with a poll, asking what the group would do. Just like in the original story, it suggested that they just kill the androids right away before they even wake up, but they decide against it, and instead they decide to train in preparation for them. But for the option you guys voted for, they also choose to go and fight Frieza. Once they release Vegeta, and he sees what a Super Saiyan is like, he brings up Frieza and asks them to help defeat him. And of course, the group doesn't actually know who Frieza is or what he's done, but Vegeta's gonna be filling them in eventually. After Vegeta's caught up to speed about what's happened since he's been sealed, and after he mentions what he knows about Super Saiyan, he begins saying what he knows about Frieza. The group is pretty terrified to hear what this Frieza guy's like, but some people like Goku are actually pretty excited to hear this. Frieza's a potentially strong foe that could be real good battle practice for them. Plus, they'd be doing the universe a favor by defeating him. Goku suggests they're gonna go right away, but then Vegeta stops them telling him he's crazy to leave right now. They need to get a lot stronger before they actually go and do that. Especially since the visitors from the future are actually gonna be leaving soon, which includes Gohan who's the only Super Saiyan. Besides delivering the heart virus medication, Gohan tries his best to tell everyone what Super Saiyan is like and how he got it, and how it feels to become one. He saw Goten come close to it before, but he never fully got his younger brother there. The least he can do is try and explain it to them, but other than that, he doesn't really know how to help them here. He of course does show it off too, and in a fight where he heavily holds back, he even tries it out against Goku. He wishes he could do more, but hopefully this will actually help, and Goku might be able to figure it out on his own. And with that, the next generation of fighters from the future takes their leave, promising that they'll return in three years when the androids are supposed to arrive. So what now? Well, Vegeta already warned everyone not to head for Frieza right away until they figure out Super Saiyan, so like he promises, he decides to join them in their training even though he doesn't really want to team up with them. He did promise it though and he doesn't have any other allies, so why not? And this could help him get stronger. As long as they help him defeat Frieza, that's all he really wants. Too bad Vegeta doesn't have a scouter because otherwise he can compare their power levels to what Frieza is at. The best info that he can give is that he was at a power level of 18,000 and Frieza in his first form is at 530,000, but that's just his first form and supposedly he might have more above that, although it might be rumors. So their basis for Frieza's power is someone who's 30 times stronger than Vegeta, which is a really weird bar to measure power in, but they don't really have anything else. And with the lack of info, anything's better than nothing. Many people have far surpassed Vegeta by now, but there's been no threat so no one's been training too seriously. 
they need to actually ramp that up now. Not only because of the androids, but because of this Frieza guy if they actually go and fight him. Training begins. And first off, Goku's gonna be spending all his time trying to become a Super Saiyan, hoping to teach Gohan and Vegeta as well. Gohan's too inexperienced right now as a fighter, and Vegeta needs to catch up in terms of power, so they all do their own training at first. And Goku is obviously with everyone, but he is focused on this goal of becoming a Super Saiyan. Speaking of Gohan, he spends most of his time training with Goku or Master Roshi, and the three of them become noticeably stronger over this time. Kind of being the outcast of the group, Piccolo joins Vegeta in his training, in order for both of them to try and catch up, and they actually end up forming somewhat of a bond. To prep for the androids, the rest of the humans, Krillin, Yamcha, and Tenshinhan, they actually go train with Kami. But they're at a point where Kami's training isn't really doing too much for them. Thankfully though, someone's been listening in and noticed the mention of Frieza and how someone wanted to try and defeat him. That of course is King Kai, who's been watching over Earth. Especially after all the weird occurrences like people coming from the future and Vegeta being freed from his seal. King Kai interrupts Kami and asks, why not send the humans up here? He'd be glad to take some students with him. The Saiyans are kinda up to their own training, so the humans could benefit greatly by coming up here. King Kai has a few things that he wants to show them. Of course, they end up accepting. King Kai's obviously not gonna take a bunch of people on his planet, so he takes those three and Roshi who comes along with them. Roshi would love to take Gohan, his student, with him, but he realizes it's more important for him to stay with Goku, because not only is Goku giving him sufficient training, but he might help him become a Super Saiyan, which will be far more beneficial. Piccolo stays back as well kind of interested in the new methods that they have of training on Earth, such as the gravity chamber. Vegeta suggests this to replicate the conditions on planet Vegeta, so Bulma built it for everyone, since it'll be beneficial not just to him, but for people like Goku, Gohan, or anyone else on Earth. Here we're going to have a little bit of a time skip, about a year and a half into the future. Half of the time has passed before the androids are supposed to arrive, and training's actually going very well. Vegeta's still behind, but with his motivation and hard work, he's actually gotten some really good gains in training. Not to mention, pretty much everyone else has seen a huge increase in power over this time period. The humans on King Kai's planet not only have gotten stronger, but have learned some impressive new techniques, such as the Kaioken, and Master Roshi even picked up something called the Spirit Bomb, whatever that's supposed to be. King Kai says this is a last resort, but it's still good for them to have in case they need it in a battle. Back on Earth, Goku, Gohan, Piccolo, and Vegeta have been doing a bunch of gravity training, and they've become noticeably stronger as well. And this group is actually the one that Vegeta's most comfortable with. He forms a rivalry with Kakarot, and his rivalry slash friendship with Piccolo develops more. Even Gohan begins to grow a liking to both of them, even with Vegeta's cold exterior. But the good thing is, he hasn't tried to kill anyone, so I guess that's a good sign for his development. Because, you know, how Vegeta was before, of course they're gonna be wary of that. Interestingly enough, over this time in training, Goku has actually tapped into Super Saiyan. How is that even possible, you might be asking? Well, you gotta consider how fast Goku learns things just from seeing them. Having it explained to him and shown to him, and having constant hard work towards it, I'm sure Goku would figure out a way to access it eventually. I mean, we've had people learn Super Saiyan in much less time, so it's actually not as crazy as it sounds. Goku feels that he's actually strong enough to go for Frieza right away, but Vegeta actually declines to go again. He doesn't want to go fight Frieza until he himself gets Super Saiyan as well. Sure, one Super Saiyan might be good, but two is much better and it makes victory more likely. Plus, it'll be nice for him to see Frieza's reaction to him becoming a Super Saiyan. That'll be a huge ego boost for Vegeta. About two years into the training, and with some extensive help and training from Goku, Vegeta does end up learning Super Saiyan, and the second he does, he decides that they want to go for Frieza. By this time now, all the humans are back on Earth because they learned pretty much everything they could from King Kai, plus in terms of training, the gravity training on Earth is probably better, instead of just being on 10 times gravity the whole time. Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, and Piccolo prepare to leave. Thanks to Bulma, they have a new spaceship too. Roshi and Krillin end up joining them as well, Tenshin and Yamcha decide to stay back, mainly because Yamcha doesn't want to leave Bulma for longer than he already has, and Ten argues that there shouldn't be any more people leaving Earth than there already is. They might need some people to defend it, just in case. Vegeta mentions a planet called Frieza Planet 79, and although King Kai is very wary of them going to fight Frieza, once he sees Super Saiyan, he's confident that they'll be able to do something to him. Prior to this, he was withholding the location of Frieza Planet 79, but now he gives it to them. He was concerned about their safety before, and that was the right choice to not tell them. Within a few weeks or so, the ship reaches the planet. Vegeta is eager to get off the ship and start fighting. This is something he's been waiting for for a while. Everyone else is too because not only is this a potential fun battle, but the experience could help and they're cleaning up the galaxy. Kui is pretty shocked as he's the first one to see Vegeta. He assumed Vegeta was dead and surprised that he's crawled back here. He keeps ridiculing Vegeta, but then he's killed in one shot. Vegeta doesn't even have to try. The Frieza Force stops being cocky and is immediately scared realizing who they're dealing with. The entire planet goes on alert. 
Frieza himself is aware of this, but he is not too concerned. He'll send out people like Zarbon, Dodoria, and possibly the Ginyu Force if he needs to. His smugness slowly fades away as then he hears that Zarbon and Dodoria have been killed by Vegeta single-handedly, so he does send the Ginyu Force, and then he hears that they're killed, also single-handedly by Vegeta. You know, the group's a little bit annoyed because Vegeta's getting all the action here, but hey, whatever. Frieza is furious, but this isn't something that he can't handle by himself. He and King Cold head out in order to face the group. Frieza even laughs when he sees the group and scans their power levels. Power levels of only four and five digits. Little does he know, they're holding back, and Vegeta decides to give him a show. Vegeta goes to his full strength and base form. Extensive gravity training has paid off. In his base, Vegeta's power level actually kind of scares Frieza. One million. The funny thing is Vegeta's not even the strongest one of the group. That would be Goku. This is the last arc that power levels will remain relevant, but just for fun, let's list them anyways. During this particular fight, Roshi has a whopping power level of 400,000, which can be increased to 6 million with a Kaioken times 20. He could thank King Kai for that. Krillin is at 350,000, and similar to Roshi, he could do the Kaioken, which would bring him to 7 million at Kaioken times 20. Piccolo is at about 450,000. He had better gravity training than Roshi, but he didn't learn a bunch of new techniques from King Kai like Roshi did, and he doesn't have the Kaioken. So he is stronger in base, but besides that, Roshi did see better gains. Frieza is particularly angry when he sees the child, a Saiyan half-breed, is actually at a power level similar to him. 500,000. But as we know, power levels aren't everything, there are people more skilled than him. So someone like Roshi or Piccolo could probably outclass him in a battle. That's besides the point though. As I mentioned, Vegeta's at 1 million right now. With Super Saiyan, that would be 50 million. With better training and gaining Super Saiyan earlier on, Goku's power is a massive 5 million, or 250 million when he's Super Saiyan. Alright, Frieza's not gonna play any games here. He instantly goes to his final form, and he actually does pretty well. He scolds Vegeta for being so foolish that he thinks he could kill Frieza of all people. Frieza even tells the Saiyan that he's not at his full power yet. He's only using about 5 or 10% of his full power in his final form. Vegeta decides to give him a surprise, asking Frieza if he's heard of the legendary Super Saiyan. Frieza's bothered by this, and asks Vegeta if he's not actually implying that he is a Super Saiyan. That can't be true. But it is. Vegeta turns into a Super Saiyan in front of Frieza, and overcome with fear, anger, and shock, he's almost completely paralyzed. This serves as a good distraction. Since Frieza's off guard, it leaves an opening for Vegeta to attack before he can actually power up to his full power. With one powerful blow to the stomach, Vegeta gravely injures Frieza, not giving him any other chances to power up. He gives one last look to Frieza and smirks. The Saiyans have finally won, and he kills Frieza on the spot. But there's still King Cold to deal with, and he's been against the other four members of the Dragon Team. They've actually been holding their own somewhat well, but King Cold is above them. Thankfully, Vegeta transforming into a Super Saiyan was a good distraction, since King Cold looked away, and that provided Krillin the perfect opportunity to use a Destructo Disc, slicing the King clean in half. Of course, in collective power, they probably wouldn't be able to overpower King Cold, but an ingenious strategy like this obviously will work. Shockingly enough, though, he would most likely survive this, but I mean, they got two Super Saiyans right there, so obviously that's not going to be that big of an issue. That was pretty easy, actually. Although, Goku's a little bit annoyed that he didn't get any opportunity to test out Super Saiyan, but Vegeta promises Goku that he could have all the fun he wants against the androids. This is all Vegeta wanted. He thanks them for helping out, and they clean up whatever remains of the planet. Satisfied, they all head back to Earth and training continues. Goku and Vegeta continue to use Super Saiyan and try to work towards getting it further. They still have just under a year left, and everyone's happy to do some gravity training. Vegeta seems like a pretty trustworthy ally now. He did seem genuinely grateful when they helped him kill Frieza, and not to mention he hasn't lashed out since. All he's been doing basically is training, and without him getting together with Bulma, that's really all he's had to do. Eventually though, the androids do arrive. First is 19 and 20. Remember how I said the androids aren't actually as strong as they were in canon? Well, that applies to these two as well. And luckily enough, Goku doesn't succumb to the heart virus this time. He does make sure to take his medicine here, either because he'd noticed the symptoms earlier from all the stress he's been going through, or just because he's around people who will constantly remind him. They're able to easily wipe out 19, but 20 ends up escaping, trying to activate 17 and 18. Gohan, Goten, and Trunks show up, and they're actually really amazed at how strong everyone's become. Goku and Vegeta have even unlocked Super Saiyan, and Gohan's even more amazed when he hears that his past self can actually do it. Especially at this age, it's crazy for him to hear that. They all try and find 20, and they eventually find his lab. But unfortunately, they're too late. He's already activated 17 and 18, who then proceed to kill him, and then activate Android 16. 
Oh, that's great. Goku's right here for them. That's their target. So immediately, they're gonna jump in and fight. The androids are very strong, but collectively, and using their full power, the group is actually able to hold their own pretty well. But even with that, the androids have infinite energy, so stamina will become a bit of an issue for them. Thankfully, Roshi's pretty keen on this and decides to break out something that he thought of before. Not the Mafuba again. No, something brand new that he learned. He gives a cue to his allies and he sneaks away from the battle, unnoticed by the androids. He goes up on one of the mountains nearby. He lifts his hands up and begins charging an attack. The Spirit Bomb, which he learned from King Kai. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't you have to have a pure heart for this? I thought Roshi was some kind of pervert that couldn't even use the Nimbus because he doesn't have a pure heart. Well yeah, you're right. But here, this isn't the same Roshi that we all know. With his life being so much more focused on training, and with all the changes he's gone through, who's to say this is the same Roshi? He's probably not even a perv anymore. And speaking of that, Krillin couldn't ride the Nimbus for the same reason, but in the Saiyan Saga, he actually was able to wield the Spear Bomb and he wasn't hurt by it. So I'm sure if he underwent that change, that Roshi could probably do the same. And even besides that, Cell claimed that he was even able to use it if he wanted. And we haven't seen it besides in the video games if he can actually do that, so I'm sure Roshi of all people would be able to use the technique as well. The androids continue their fight, slowly gaining ground, but then they notice something odd. Some sort of light is glowing off the people that they're fighting. It's not like the aura that they're used to seeing. And then they notice something else. It seems that the group is one person short. 17 asks 18 if they killed Roshi without knowing, and they ask 16 as well and no one knows. And then finally, they realize what's happening. After seeing a massive glow from behind them, they turn around and look up in the sky, and they see a giant ball of energy, with Master Roshi underneath. The Dragon Team gives more energy, including future Gohan, Goten, and Trunks who don't know what's going on but decide to help anyways. The ball grows rapidly, and Roshi flings it towards the androids. Thinking that this won't be anything to them, they attempt to hold it off. And it's hard, but they are briefly able to. Roshi powers up with Kaioken times 20 to push it further, but it's still not working. Suddenly, he's joined with the help of his students. Goku, Gohan, Yamcha, and Krillin. Yamcha and Krillin turn on their Kaioken as Goku and Gohan go Super Saiyan. The bomb slowly gets pushed towards the androids. And then suddenly, it gets pushed more and more. 16 begins to break apart, as 17 and 18 feel the pain of the bomb. It ends up engulfing them, completely absorbing them, and then flying off into space and exploding, creating a giant crevice in the path that it follows. Good thing they didn't try to dodge it because they don't actually know how to sense the android's energy, so who knows if the bomb would actually track them or not. Everyone powers down, tired out, but victorious. The androids have been defeated. Oh yeah, and Cell shows up, but he doesn't have anyone to absorb, so he gets killed eventually too. At least once everyone finds out about him. If the androids were as strong as they were in canon with all the data that they had, they would be a much harder challenge, and they probably wouldn't be able to be beaten. But here, all ends well. The only thing is though that Gohan, Gochen, and Trunks have realized long ago that this isn't their timeline. So whatever happens here won't affect them. So how are they supposed to defeat the androids? What could they do now? We'll save that for the next episode because we're going to leave off here for now. Not only are the kids from the future pretty concerned, but also they now know that Cell will probably be in their timeline as well, so they don't really know what they're supposed to do. They have to somehow find a way to defeat the androids and Cell now. They saved this timeline and had the androids defeated here, which is great, but this won't affect their timeline at all, which is a little bit concerning to them. Suddenly, they hear a voice from above, Kami. Kami interjects to help everyone. He's been watching over, wanting to make sure that the planet would be okay. He tells everyone to come up to the lookout because he might have something to help the time travelers. Everyone's pretty surprised to be contacted by Kami, and he tells them about the Room of Spirit and Time. Goku briefly went in there as a kid, and he completely forgot about it. With this room, one day on the outside will be one year's worth of training on the inside, so they could spend some time training in here. The thing is though, Gohan, Goten, and Trunks have already done a lot of training, and training amongst themselves might not help. The Room of Spirit and Time does have more intense areas to train in which will be beneficial, but the three of them still decide to split up, wanting to make sure that they get the best experience possible. Gohan is first going to do a bunch of gravity training with some of the other fighters, as well as Trunks. And in the meantime, Goku's going to take Goten into the room to unlock Super Saiyan for him. A day passes, and they are able to accomplish this. Goku had some great bonding time with his son, and not only did Goten get stronger, but Goku got a little bit stronger as well, and Goten is finally able to go Super Saiyan now. This day of training allowed him to get much stronger. But now, Roshi decides he wants to take Trunks in to teach him something. Remember, this isn't the same Trunks that we all know. After all, he is a full human here. So while all those Saiyans run off and get their Super Saiyan or whatever, Roshi's gonna teach Trunks something different. Even though Trunks may not be as strong as the other two, he's just as motivated, and Roshi wants to help him out by teaching him the Kaioken. 
and potentially a few other techniques. This unlikely duo heads into the time chamber for a year, and this plan actually works because Trunks is able to access Kyle Ken now. Let's say he can go up to about times 20. Alright, so Goten and Trunks have new abilities, but is this really going to help against the androids? Not particularly, but one more day of training for Gohan and Goten should do the trick. Given the intensity of the Room of Spirit and Time, and now with the fact that Goten is a Super Saiyan, they could train much more effectively, and they'll be strong enough to take on the androids alone. Everyone is amazed with how powerful they are once they exit the Room of Spirit and Time. None of them have ever seen anything like it before. This training definitely will help. They should be more than enough now to defeat the androids. And it's amazing what the Room of Spirit and Time can do. With their training complete, the three of them head back to their timeline, thanking everyone for their help. And getting the same thanks in return for helping stop the androids here. Now, we enter a period of peace. And there are quite a few changes over this time skip. Over this time, Roshi gets his own idea after seeing what happened with the Room of Spirit and Time. Now that he knows about it and sees how effective it is, it gets him thinking. What if he were to use this to train? So while other people might not want to go into the Room of Spirit and Time for days on end, Roshi has kind of a different circumstance here. Considering he's over 300 years old, what's another couple of years to him? He's already had centuries of experience and training, so this is probably right up his alley anyways. And as for his age, I feel like that might not be a problem. Roshi technically is already immortal and hasn't been aging at all. And even though he's above 300 years old, he doesn't really look it. Physically, he still did look kinda old, but not really that old. The immortality that he gained means that he won't die of old age. And judging by his appearance, it seems that it means he won't age either. Because otherwise he'd probably look something like Grand Elder Guru. So for that reason, I believe that his youth is already eternal, basically. And going in the Room of Spirit and Time won't hasten his aging. And besides, if it actually does, Roshi can always get the Dragon Balls and modify his wish to make himself eternally youthful. So he can always remain a valuable asset to Earth and the team. But over these seven years, technically Roshi could just spam the Room of Spirit and Time now and again. I don't mean he's going to be in there constantly over the few years. I'd say about a day or two per year or so which essentially means he gets 7 to 14 extra years worth of training during this time, and it allows him to remain as one of the strongest fighters on the Dragon Team. In here, not only does he work on improving his strength, but he tries to control Kyle Ken to further levels, as well as improving his current techniques. Anyone is welcome to join him, but since they don't have the similar circumstances that he has where they don't really age, they're not too keen on it. Maybe once in a blue moon, Krillin, Tien, Yamcha might join him, but they won't be in it nearly as constantly as Roshi is. And given the amount of time that he spends on the lookout, Kami even has a proposition for Roshi. Kind of like he did with Goku in Dragon Ball, he offers Roshi the position of Guardian. And this is a pretty hefty offer, but not one Roshi would accept. At least not at the moment. Kami kind of was looking for a new candidate anyways, and Roshi seems like he would fit that. And while it's not going to happen right now, I want to see what you guys think about this, because I feel like this is a conversation that would come up. With how often he's up there and around Kami, he'd most likely be asked it eventually given all the qualifications he fulfills. So I'm actually going to leave a short poll. Do you think sometime in the future Roshi may accept this position, or just something he would never end up doing? Be sure to vote and let me know. Anyways, there are a few other things that happen over the 7 years. With Goku around, as well as with the encouragement of Roshi, Gohan and Goten end up training a lot more, with Goten even joining the Turtle School as a student. Chi Chi's fine with it as long as it doesn't interfere with his studies, so he goes along with it, as well as Gohan. And as for Vegeta, he often spends his time training with Goku and Gohan. I mean, Vegeta doesn't really have much else to do. He doesn't really have any responsibilities here. He's not with Bulma, so basically all he's doing right now is training and trying to catch up to Goku. He's angry that he can't get there quick enough, but he keeps trying and trains furiously. He knows one day he will be able to surpass Kakarot. Over the seven years as well, Goku and Gohan are able to unlock Super Saiyan 2 which they discovered during their training and they didn't even know really existed. They were able to go through the other grades of Super Saiyan first, and then eventually access this form, which is a huge discovery for them. And of course, over the 7 year time period, Gohan does eventually become the Great Saiyan Man. And that gives me a small opportunity to address something. In some of my what ifs where Gohan eventually does end up becoming the Great Saiyan Man, I often get comments about how the Ginyu Force is the influence behind this. And Gohan didn't meet the Ginyu Force in this scenario, so why would he become the Great Saiyan Man? Well, that's not actually true, because in the series, the real reason Gohan became Great Saiyan Man is because he wanted to fight crime, and he actually just needed a costume for it to protect his identity. Him not meeting the Ginyu Force wouldn't really affect him being the Great Saiyan Man. Maybe he wouldn't do all the goofy poses as a Great Saiyan Man, but he still would obtain the Great Saiyan Man identity nonetheless. It's a small point, but I did want to mention it because people will probably question it in this video as well, since he didn't meet the Ginyu Force here. At least not to the extent that he normally did. Back on topic, besides the part with him training with Goten, the Saiyan Man saga goes pretty much the same, he ends up meeting Videl, 
and all is well. Interestingly enough, a new tournament is coming up. And while everyone laid low over the past 7 years, this could be an opportunity for them to have some fun. It's been a while since they've been in a tournament, and it'll be a nice way to test their new powers. So in terms of who gets in, the roster does change a little bit this time. There's no Android 18, because well, she's dead. I'll also say that Killa and Mighty Mask don't make the cut here, and replacing these three on the roster will be Roshi, Yamcha, and Tien. Roshi actually considers joining as Jackie Chun this time, but he doesn't really need to. He might as well have fun instead of trying to wear some disguise for it, because he doesn't really need to here. The next few bits of the tournament go somewhat normal. It starts with Krillin facing Yamcha instead of Pintar, and Krillin gets the win, but besides that, everything else remains pretty much normal. Shin and Kibito make their presence known, as do Spopovich and Yamu, who then end up actually stealing some energy from Gohan. Pretty standard stuff so far, but it's about to change rapidly here. When departing for the ship, Yamcha decides to stay back to make sure his family's safe, and Tien decides to stick with him and Chaozu. In case something bad happens, they want to make sure everyone here will be okay. And it seems like they're sending more than enough people to Bobbity's ship, right? Well, things might not go that smoothly. You'll see what I mean. They arrive at the ship, after chasing Spopovich and Yamu down, who then proceed to get blown up by Bobbity. They keep a low profile and far away, they see a pink man standing there talking to Bobbity. Shin says that this guy is Debora, the king of the demon realm, but Debora knows that he's being watched, so he might as well introduce himself. He notices that the group is somewhat large and seems to have some strong people in it, so he's going to be a little bit cautious this time. He goes up to them and attacks Kibito first, killing him instantly. He knows that Bobbity needs some energy, so he shouldn't freeze all the people here, but spitting on one or two of the fighters there should be good enough, and it'll make sure that he's safe while still being able to gather some energy. He decides to freeze two of the strongest people there, Goku and Gohan. Before Shin can even react and warn everyone, they're spit on. And slowly but surely, Goku and Gohan are turned into stone. Things obviously don't look too good here. Deborah retreats back into the ship, coaxing everyone to come inside. Despite Shin's warnings, Vegeta and Piccolo are the first to head in, followed by Roshi and Krillin, and then finally Shin. Once they get into the ship, Vegeta wastes no time. He kills Pui Pui and immediately heads to the next floor, killing Yakan next. They're all a little bit concerned because Vegeta is still kind of a loose cannon here. Yeah, he's a good guy, but he's not really as mellowed out as he was in the original story. He should be fine though, right? Next up, everyone has to face Deborah, and Deborah is actually very strong, so they're going to have to find a way to actually fend him off. The thing is, if Roshi, Krillin, Vegeta, and Piccolo all fought together, I think they might actually be enough. Especially if Roshi and Krillin use their Kaioken. As for Vegeta, let's talk about him a little bit here. Over the time skip, he's made some progress, but like I said, he's still not anywhere near Goku or Gohan. He's barely able to go into Super Saiyan 2, and he is strong, but not nearly as strong as he was originally. He still wants to get stronger and surpass Kakarot somehow, and he's wondering if there's any way that he can get above them. Anyways, the four of them face Deborah, and they actually do pretty well. If only Roshi carried a few capsules with him to use the Mafuba, he should remember that in the future, because if he did that, the fight would be pretty much instant. They end up defeating the Demon King, and that means Goku and Gohan return to normal. They're no longer statues. The two of them are briefly confused, but then realize what happened, and they're wondering if they should head into the ship or not. They can't sense any of the evil keys they sensed before, so they assume everyone has it under control. But something seems a little off. It's a little bit too calm. Little do they know that inside the ship right now, Bobbity is currently possessing Vegeta. Shin tries to get him to resist it, but the attempts are futile. And like normal, we get Majin Vegeta. In the moment, everyone completely forgets about Goku and Gohan, distracted by the evil Vegeta in front of them. They snap back to reality, and Shin tells Piccolo to go and find them. But before Piccolo can even head out of the ship, they're teleported back to the World Tournament, leaving Goku and Gohan in the middle of nowhere near the ship. They sense everyone's key disappear, and they head in to see what's going on. Bobbity is too distracted to notice them, but they eventually make it to the bottom floor and they find out what's going on. Somehow they all got teleported out of here, and Bobbity's the only one left. And they don't know what's going on, but they sense a really powerful spike and key. They search around and then they find it. They're back at the World Tournament Arena somehow? This doesn't really look too good. They're gonna head back there immediately and see if they could stop what's happening. Thankfully for Bobbity, he was narrowly able to avoid Goku and Gohan, and it seems his plan is working. He's gathering enough energy for Majin Buu's revival. Back at the tournament, Vegeta decides to give a show of force. Roshi is the one to stand against him, ready to defeat Vegeta once again. They try to get the crowd to evacuate as Vegeta fires a blast of energy towards it. It's a good thing Tien and Yamcha stayed back, because with a brief flash of Kaioken, they were just barely able to deflect the blast saving a bunch of people in the process. No one knows what happened, but Shin explains. Vegeta's been possessed, and now he's under the control of Bobbity. Little do they know that Vegeta did this completely willingly, and he's a completely loose cannon. He's ready to fight, 
and his goal right now is to defeat Kakarot, but he doesn't actually know where Goku is right now, assuming that he's still back at Babidi's ship. He was right, he could sense Goku's key and it's coming towards the tournament fast. Vegeta escapes and heads towards Goku, as everyone chases after him. They eventually all meet up and find Goku and Gohan in the middle of nowhere flying towards the tournament, and Vegeta immediately attacks Goku. But Goku isn't even really phased by this. Well, when he's in base it kinda hurts, but once he goes up to Super Saiyan, it doesn't really affect him too much. Even with this boost from becoming a Majin, he's still not enough to surpass Goku. This enrages him further. He begins fighting Goku, and Goku tells everyone that he can handle Vegeta alone. Shin then arrives after everyone is safe, and mentions that they have to find Bobbity. He then notices Vegeta is fighting Goku, and things are looking very bad. This is exactly what Bobbity wants, and they need to stop this fight somehow. The group yells out to Goku, telling him to stop because fighting Vegeta will just give Babidi more energy. And while Goku can pretty much tank everything, Vegeta is still fighting him, expelling energy that's going right to Babidi. He has no choice but fighting, and they need to make it fast and somehow defeat Vegeta, but apparently it's too late now. Gohan gave them more energy than usual, and as for the fight with Deborah, that fight dragged on for a while, and it had more people participating, so with those two factors combined, he had more energy from the get-go. And even though Vegeta's fight with Goku has been brief so far, Babidi still was able to gather enough energy, and that set him right over the edge to revive Boo. Just as Goku knocks Vegeta out, they could sense something terrible in the distance. Shin knows that this is it. Majin Boo has been revived. So what is everyone going to do now? Well, we're going to save that for the next episode. And also, Goten wins the kids division of the tournament, and that's not really too important, but I want to put it out there so you guys know that Goten took a W here. And with that brief disclaimer done, we're going to leave off here for now. So of course, the second Boo is revived, he begins his rampage. Vegeta even briefly stops his fight with Goku, sensing what's happened. And they all seem utterly screwed right now. There's no way any one of them can take on Boo. They could tell from his sheer power alone that this isn't going to be any easy task. It may even be impossible. Roshi briefly departs, saying that he's going to leave for a bit so he can get a container and a seal, trying to use his Mafuba, since he doesn't really see any other option. While Roshi leaves to get that, Boo gets ever so closer to the group, and they need to fight him somehow. At the moment, Vegeta is a little bit panicked and confused right now, while he was able to ignore Bobbity before, he's so heavily conflicted right now, and with his vulnerable mental state, it gives Bobbity an opening to try and retake control. Bobbity begins whispering to him in his mind, talking to Vegeta on a personal level. Isn't he upset that he couldn't defeat Goku? And worst of all, now they're ignoring him as if Vegeta isn't even a threat. They don't see him as an obstacle, he's clearly not powerful enough to take on Goku right now. Vegeta tries to resist, but Bobbity takes control over Vegeta again, and tells him this time to attack Shin. If he does this, that'll give them an opening to defeat Goku, possibly. Vegeta's fighting against it, and he looks over towards the Kai as Bobbity begins giving him more orders. Vegeta is resisting harder, and everyone begins to see that something's clearly changing within Vegeta. They don't really know what to do. They don't necessarily want to kill Vegeta, but if they try and knock him out or sedate him, he'll probably escape and cause more havoc. He's extremely volatile right now, almost like a ticking time bomb. Shaking ferociously, Vegeta lifts up his hand, trying to resist Bobbidi's control. Bobbidi struggles to gain more and more control and Vegeta is noticeably getting more and more stressed. Shin sees this, and he tries to see if he could reverse it somehow. This leaves him open for an attack, and Bobbidi tells Vegeta to do it now. Bobbidi promises more power. As he struggles further for control, he screams out and then fires a blast, which hits Shin directly. Vegeta is briefly distracted now, and this lets Goku land a powerful hit on his neck, holding back his power so he doesn't get frustrated and accidentally kill him. He only wants to knock Vegeta out here. Vegeta falls to the ground unconscious, and no one knows what to do now. They go over to Shin, but Vegeta clearly didn't restrain here. Shin is dead, and without Shin's guidance, they don't know what to do now. Boo gets closer and closer to the group, as well as Bobbidi. The group decides now that they need to find the Dragon Balls, in order to revive Shin and anyone else who has died so far. Keeping their power low so they don't get detected by Boo, they fly off. Boo's rampage continues on, with Bobbidi at the helm. While the Dragon Team tries to find the Dragon Balls, Roshi finally finds what he needs, and gets a container and a seal. This is pretty risky, but he decides now that he's going to face Boo himself, trying to use the Mafuba to seal him. He decides this after getting in contact with the others, realizing that they need some sort of distraction so they can get the Dragon Balls without being interrupted. It's very risky, but it may buy the group some time they need in case Boo tries to track them down. And for all they know, it could work. He plans on using it on Boo and then killing Bobbidi. So if he can actually accomplish this, then all the threat will be gone. Roshi makes haste as he heads towards Boo. He arrives, confronting the Magician and the Majin. Without hesitation, he immediately prepares the technique with Boo confused as to what's going on. As quickly as possible, Roshi launches his Mafuba. Bobbidi reacts quickly, and he just laughs at this. 
He's easily able to deflect this himself, and instead of the Mafuba hitting Boo, it goes right back to Roshi, as Babidi seals the Turtle Hermit himself. With his own attack, Roshi was defeated, and he's now stuck in the container. Babidi takes the container with Roshi inside of it and keeps it to himself, holding onto it because it might be useful in the future for Ransom. This will also be a funny thing to display in his room, a container with a 300-something-year-old man inside of it. Pretty cool. Thankfully, the Dragon Team does get the Dragon Balls, and they are able to revive everyone. They're on the lookout, and by summoning Shenron, this alerts Boo and Bobbity pretty easily. You know, with a giant dragon in the sky and all. But they expected this coming. The good thing is they revived everyone. But now they have to face Boo because he's coming towards them quick. Arriving on the lookout, Boo is ready for the fight, but so is the Dragon Team. This all seems hopeless. Boo is way too powerful, but they're going to put up a fight anyways. They're not going to go down so easily. Is there any coming back from this? Roshi's in a container. Boo is too powerful, and Vegeta is possibly still possessed although unconscious. Even though Shin is back, he can't find a way for them to escape, because they're too preoccupied with Boo for him to teleport all of them out of here. Kabito is at least able to help heal people, but Bobby is keen to pick up on this and Boo attacks Kabito, knocking him out so he can't be used to heal anymore. Boo has absolutely decimated everyone, they're all near death. It seems Bobby will finally have completed his plan. By this point, they've all fallen below the lookout. At least they were able to lead Boo off of there, and anyone up there will remain safe. On the ground below, Boo is ready to finish everyone off, and Bobbity is grinning like a madman. This is it. This is what he wanted. As Boo prepares a final blast to kill everyone, they hear a voice behind them. A deep, angry voice that only says one thing. Who killed me? Bobbity and Boo turn around and react in horror, as Bobbity is eradicated with a single blast by someone. The container he's holding is sent flying into a nearby cliff, which explodes and then frees Roshi. Roshi is terrified right now and pretty much paralyzed out of fear. And then he sees what's going on. The group is barely conscious and can't see who's there, but they watch as Boo is chopped cleanly into shreds with a slice of some claws. He recovers easily, of course, but even he can't see his opponent. This guy's moving too fast, it seems. Angered, steam begins emerging from him as he's frustrated while trying to fight. But suddenly, he stops. He's paralyzed in fear as his face contorts into one of terror, and he's greeted with a single hand in front of his face. One word is uttered, and it's the last thing Boo ever hears. Hakai. Boo is erased, and all the specks of him disappear. As he dissipates, a shadowy figure is revealed in front of his absence. It's Lord Beerus. As soon as he got revived, he came here, wanting to take out the trash. Whis brought him here immediately. Beerus can't believe that Shin allowed himself to die, which meant that Beerus died as well temporarily. Especially while he was in the middle of his nap. He was enjoying it, but then suddenly, he was dead. A little bit ticked off, he came here and decided to handle it himself, wanting to destroy whoever interrupted his slumber. But then he sees all the people around Shin. He asked Whis to confirm, and apparently they are Saiyans. He thought they were all dead, and it reminds him of something. He recalls a dream that he was having, well, before he was interrupted in his nap. He didn't get to enjoy those dreams to the fullest, but he's had some odd ones over the past few decades about some sort of Saiyan legend, some sort of super Saiyan god he thinks it was. Or at least, that's what he feels like it is. He does bring this up and ask if they know anything about it, but they're completely speechless and don't know what he's talking about, or who he is, or why he's here. Everyone's lost right now. But Beerus lets out a yawn, and he tells these people that he will be back soon. He's pretty tired out and he does want to go back to sleep, at least for another year or two. He tells them they should try and find out about this Super Saiyan God thing, as payment for him taking out Boo, because it was clear that they wouldn't be able to do it themselves. He tells Shin and Kabuto to get back to their planet too, in order to not get killed again. And they immediately comply, thanking everyone for the help and teleporting away. Beerus yawns and tells everyone he'll see them soon, with everyone left completely dumbfounded. Vegeta's Majin curse is gone by now, and he's feeling a bit of mixed emotions at the moment. Well, partially he does feel fear because Beerus showed up and he told everyone who he is. But more so, he's dealing with his own feelings of unimportance, his sadness about his defeat, and his guilt for causing so much havoc. And where did it get him? Nowhere. All he got was a tiny Zenkai out of it. He wasn't able to defeat Goku, assert his dominance, or do anything really. All he did was make things worse. He decides he's going to work on bettering himself once again, as to not lose control in the future. Not knowing how to confront everyone about what just happened, he goes off alone, wanting to train in solitude. With the immense guilt he's feeling, he feels he can't face anyone right now, partially ashamed. Although by killing Shin, Vegeta did indirectly save Earth, because if he didn't do that, then Beerus wouldn't have died and gotten angered by Boo. So it's not all that bad. One year passes after training, and the Dragon Balls are active again. During this time, Goku and Gohan have been training intensely, trying to unlock some sort of new form, terrified by Beerus. 
They can't find Vegeta anywhere, and they know he wants to be alone so they don't decide to bother him. They were actually able to unlock something, Super Saiyan 3. It is kind of cool for the time being, but it has a bunch of issues with it in terms of stamina, and they could tell us just the next step is Super Saiyan and not Super Saiyan God. Plus, the thing is that Gohan's getting a little too busy to train right now. I mean, the dude is finishing up school and he's in a committed relationship. Super Saiyan 3 is kind of cool, but he is at his wit's end about the Super Saiyan God thing. Roshi has even tried to train Goku himself, but he knows he can't really do too much about a Super Saiyan God. I mean, he barely knows anything about Saiyans in general, but the Super Saiyan God thing is something else. But since it's a god form apparently, he decides maybe he should try and ask Kami. Going back up to the lookout, Roshi consults him, since he is a god and all and he might know something. But Kami doesn't know anything at all. He does have a suggestion though. They could ask Shenron. It has been a year and the Dragon Balls are active again, so maybe they could just ask Shenron and he'll give them an answer. Speaking of Kami and Roshi, there is something I want to bring up here. If you guys remember that poll from a few parts ago where I asked about Roshi becoming the next Guardian of Earth, well, it's going to take a bit of time, but Roshi has begun his training for it in the past year or so. He occasionally visits King Kai, or trains in the Room of Spirit and Time, trying to improve himself as much as he can. And by becoming Guardian of Earth, he could probably get a lot of cool benefits from it. And it seems like this is a good next step for him. As for the Turtle School, he plans on passing it on to one of his students. But if Roshi truly wants to better himself, he needs to take this next step in his life. And he's been sticking with Kami and learning a lot of godly techniques and training. He's far, far above Kami in terms of power already. But think of him kind of like an apprentice guardian right now. Kind of like how Kai's have apprentice Kai's. Maybe if Roshi is lucky enough, he'll be able to move up further, but that's a bit far off for him to think about right now. All you guys should know is that he's been continuing his training and now he's looking towards this new direction. Anywho, the group does gather the Dragon Balls, and they ask Shenron about Super Saiyan God. He brings up the ritual, and it will be kind of an issue because at the time, there's only four Saiyans on Earth. And the thing is here, there's no Videl either because she's not pregnant with Pan yet. That's a few years off. And as for one of the Saiyans on Earth, they don't know what he's up to or even if he's on planet right now. Vegeta is completely secluded off somewhere by himself, doing Kami knows what. So they either do need to get two more Saiyans, or they have to find some other way to get this power. But they did pick up something from Shenron that was interesting. He mentioned something about God Ki, and how a Super Saiyan God would have God Ki infused within them. And this gets Goku thinking. He remembers that when Beerus and Whis came to Earth, he couldn't sense them at all, even though he knew they were clearly very powerful. That must be whatever that God Key is, something that is untraceable by the normal person. So if Goku can find a way to get that somehow, maybe that'll let him get Super Saiyan God without a ritual. Goku heads up to the lookout and consults Kami. And just like Roshi beforehand, Kami has no help to offer him. He doesn't know why people keep asking him questions about this. I'm just joking, Kami's not actually pissed off, he's very helpful. And he and Roshi are on the lookout right now. Kami tells Goku that he doesn't know much about God Key or how one could get it, but maybe if Goku were to train with Beerus, Whis, or someone like that, he could get it himself. So all Kami could really suggest is telling Goku to ask Beerus if he could train him. Because otherwise he doesn't really know how Goku can get God Key. Goku thanks them, and then he returns to his training. Not long after, Beerus eventually wakes from his slumber, saddened that he couldn't get as good of a rest as usual. And he tries to remember what he was going to do. Ah yeah, right when he woke up, he wanted to head back to Earth and find the Super Saiyan God. Hopefully, these guys have some answers for him. He arrives on Earth, years earlier than normal, and instead of getting answers, he only gets a question instead. Goku asks to train with him and Whis. Beerus is a bit taken aback, but then Goku explains everything, and Beerus thinks he understands. Maybe this would be a good way for him to get Super Saiyan God, and it could potentially work. But Beerus does have a question. Why isn't Vegeta here? What's he up to? So what has Vegeta been up to? Beerus will be on Earth at any moment. Does Vegeta know that? They have no way of contacting him, and they can't even sense where he is. Is he on Earth? Is he even alive? It's been about a year since anyone's seen him, maybe a little bit longer. But Vegeta's actually doing A-OK. -okay. He's doing way better than before, actually. He's in good hands right now, and the person he's with actually does know that Beerus is heading towards Earth. So now, Vegeta knows too. Right now, Vegeta's actually with Shin and Kibito. They're training towards Super Saiyan God. Why not actually train with some gods? So how did this all happen? Well, Shin ended up coming back to Earth briefly to make sure everything was all set, wanted to get rid of any trace of Bobbidi or Deboer being there. Also, wanting to check up on Vegeta, because that whole Majin Vegeta thing was kinda terrifying and they wanted to make sure he's over that now. After the arc ended, Vegeta was off by himself in a wasteland, and Shin and Kibito were able to track him down easily, and once they found him, Vegeta actually asked. He wanted to train under them, wanting to grow stronger and wanting to make up for what he did before. He's caused so much havoc on Earth and it's always led to bad things. And even with all the havoc he's caused, he hasn't gotten noticeably stronger. He's still not on Kakarot's level, or even Gohan's for that matter. Even that old man that became young, he's starting to catch up a bit. 
Vegeta wants to atone for his sins. And Shin and Kabuto are of course very hesitant, especially since Vegeta did kill Shin before, but of course he does realize Vegeta was possessed at the time and wasn't in the right state of mind. And the thing is, he seems sincere. He seems a lot different from before, like the events of the Buu Saga changed him as a person. Well, Shin and Kabuto consider this. Training with them might actually help Vegeta not be a loose cannon, plus he could potentially be a Kai apprentice. It would be cool to train someone under them. And also, they do want Beerus to be pleased, so maybe taking a Saiyan student isn't that bad of an idea. The Kais ask Vegeta if they should take Goku and Gohan as well, but Vegeta asks for them not to. He can't even face them right now. He's definitely feeling some regret for his actions in the past, and he doesn't know if he'd be able to focus well while training with them. And to be fair, Shin and Kabuto don't really want to take more than one student. This isn't necessarily something they're too used to, but they accept and they take Vegeta. Fast forward a bit and Vegeta's been making some great progress. First of all, he doesn't have to worry about injury on this planet because he could be healed easily, meaning he could train very rigorously and exploit Zenkais occasionally. But more importantly, Shin and Kabuto can tell he's changed as a person. He not only now wants to pursue Super Saiyan God, but he's actually a little bit motivated to learn techniques that Kais use. After all the destruction and chaos he's caused, maybe becoming a Supreme Kai, someone who creates stuff, would be a good change for him. Not only would it make him stronger, but it would help him redeem himself. Vegeta's also been able to pull out the Z-Sword from its stone, and he's gotten some good training with it. This is amazing for Shin and Kabito, they never thought someone would be able to do this. And Vegeta's actually been training very well with it. He sees a very noticeable increase in power once he's training with the Z-Sword. And although he is making some great progress, one day sadly, the sword breaks into two. Maybe he was a little too rigorous with it, or he's too strong to wield it now. He profusely apologizes, while Shin and Kabito go in a bit of a panic. But then another voice butts in and calms them down. Scared for a second because they don't know who's here, they all turn around and see an old man dressed in a Kai costume. Elder Kai has been freed from the Z-Sword. Apparently, the person who actually sealed him in there was Beerus. He then is able to learn about this Vegeta guy that Shin and Kabito are training, and apparently he's supposed to rival Beerus in power someday. Sure, he seems really strong now, but Elder Kai knows that he's not going to be anything for Beerus, at least not as he is right now. Kinda wanted to get back at Beerus for sealing him in the sword, he decides he wants to help out Vegeta a bit, give him a nice boost in power, that might help. Vegeta is obviously pretty confused, but then they figure out that Elder Kai has a ritual that unlocks someone's hidden potential. Although it's going to take a bit of time, but Vegeta has more than enough here. For days on end, he sits as Elder Kai dances around him, and Shin and Kabito watch in confusion. Is he actually doing anything? Vegeta is getting a bit impatient, but he can tell it's working. And eventually the ritual is complete, it doesn't even need to be cut short. Vegeta is amazed by this new power. Screw Super Saiyan forms, this thing's awesome! And the thing is, the more he trains with this, the stronger it will grow. Ultimate Vegeta is born. But will it be enough for Beerus? Well, they still have a few months left to train, and Vegeta's made great progress in terms of strength. But now, the Kais want to teach him some more godly techniques. For the next few months, they train rigorously, with Vegeta as an official Supreme Kai apprentice. And while he doesn't do it, he does learn a Patara fusion. Thankfully, Elder Kai was there, because otherwise he might have accidentally fused with Shin and been stuck like that permanently. Elder Kai scolds Shin for not knowing this, but of course Vegeta does have to wear the Batara earrings now as a Supreme Kai apprentice. And as an apprentice, he would end up learning the Kai Kai, and he'd be able to heal people. Plus, with the extensive training he's getting, he might be able to create Kachin out of thin air like the Kais can. He is learning everything, not just strength, but techniques, and also bettering himself as a person. This is some very important development for him, and it's good he got all this training because one day, they can sense that Beerus is coming to Earth. Even Vegeta senses it. It's weird. He didn't sense Beerus before when he was on Earth, but now he can for some reason? Obviously, they all don't know too much about God Ki, but Vegeta might be able to access it from his training with the Kais. They are gods after all, and with his extensive training, I'm sure he'd be able to unlock this key. I mean, he also is a Supreme Kai now after all. Sensing Beerus on Earth fighting someone, Vegeta decides he's gonna head there and check it out. Shin wishes him luck, as Vegeta teleports to Earth. Beerus is in the middle of a fight with Goku, who's showing off Super Saiyan 3 but pointing out its flaws. Beerus is impressed that he was able to discover this, but it still doesn't seem like enough. It's definitely no Super Saiyan God. Suddenly, their fight is interrupted by Vegeta. They haven't seen him in so long, and now he's wearing some weird outfit. Then it clicks with them. That's the same outfit that Shin and Kabito were wearing. Beerus is actually pretty amused. The former Prince of Saiyans is now training to become a Supreme Kai. That's a really odd and unexpected turn of events, considering the people that the Saiyans were. But he inquires. So with all this godly training that Vegeta got, does he know Super Saiyan God by now? And of course, Goku and everyone else was wondering where Vegeta was. But they're going to save those questions for later. Vegeta tells Beerus that he doesn't know yet, but he has a good idea. He tells Beerus and Whis to come along with him. 
because he wants to bring them somewhere. I mean, Whis can just take them wherever they want to go, but Vegeta tells him that he has instant teleportation now, so it will make things much faster. It's a little suspicious, but Beerus shrugs it off. If anything bad goes wrong, he'll just erase Vegeta. The two go with Vegeta, and he teleports somewhere weird. He actually went to Zuno's place. If you remember from Super, this is the guy that knows pretty much everything about the universe and everything in it. Screw asking Shenron about this, they could just ask Zuno. And once he sees Beerus and Whis, he's immediately kind of terrified. So he's willing to answer as many questions as they want, and he's not going to be picky this time. So they begin asking away. Zuno tells him everything about Godly Key, which Vegeta actually already has access to. And he talks about Super Saiyan God. As far as he knows, they can't do a ritual because they don't have enough Saiyans. But since Vegeta has Godly Key, and if he's able to train towards this form, he should be able to unlock it. And Zuno tells him more about how to actually go about this. So it seems Vegeta's already on course to obtaining the form. And Beerus and Whis are actually pretty surprised. The three of them return to Earth, and Vegeta promises that he'll train to achieve Super Saiyan God. Beerus is a little bit impatient, but he's glad that they've been making progress, and Vegeta seems promising. And just to help out, he tells Goku and Gohan to come over towards him. And then, he lends both of them a bunch of his energy, placing his hands on their backs. They feel empowered temporarily, but what is this for? With what he learned about Godly Ki, he hopes by doing this, he was able to infuse it within Goku and Gohan, giving them a little bit of a head start. If he's not able to reach it, they may be able to and actually please Beerus. He sticks around to answer some questions about where he's been and what he's been up to, but Vegeta's not actually going to stick around on Earth anymore. He's completely devoted to Shin and his Supreme Kai training. He apologizes for what he's done before, and he says his goodbyes to everyone as he heads back to the sacred world of Kais. Beerus is a little bit underwhelmed, but at least he knows this myth actually isn't a myth. Actually, the more he thinks about it, he's a little bit ticked off. Shin has a student? Does he think he's better than Beerus? He decides he wants to take a student now, and his student will be way better than the one that Shin has. He asks Goku and Gohan, and the thing is Gohan can't really leave Earth for as long as Goku can, but he assures that he will be training. And Goku's pretty excited to hear about this prospect, so he decides to go along with Beerus. This cements the rivalry between Beerus and Shin, as well as Vegeta and Goku. And meanwhile, Gohan's gonna stay on Earth training in his own way, possibly with Roshi again. The three Saiyans all have their own route to training. Vegeta's with Shin, Goku is with Beerus and Whis, and Gohan is left to his own devices on Earth with Roshi, Piccolo, and everyone else around him. It seems Vegeta is already showing great growth as well, and Beerus hopes that he and Whis can train Goku to be way better than that. And I did mention Roshi. What's he been up to? Vegeta and Goku aren't the only apprentices right now. Roshi is also an apprentice of Kami this time. See these little parallels here? What, Guardian of Earth? That's kind of lame. Actually, I feel like it's kind of fitting for Roshi. Sure, training under a Supreme Kai or a God of Destruction is awesome, but Roshi is much more dedicated to Earth, as well as his new teacher, Kami. So being guardian to Earth might not be the most lucrative thing, but it is what he wants. Gohan consults him to train, and surprisingly, Roshi has become exponentially stronger. He strengthened his body and his mind, becoming way more patient and training more and more in the Room of Spirit and Time. The time he spends in there doesn't bother him too much. He wants to be the strongest guardian to Earth that he can be, and Kami is pleased to see that he's patient enough to stay in there for so long. To test both of their powers, Gohan begins fighting Roshi in Super Saiyan 3. Roshi's able to point out the flaws of this form before Gohan can even tell him. He's very quick to pick up on it, and he decides he wants to teach Gohan some things. In terms of power, he still doesn't match up to Super Saiyan 3 Gohan, but he far exceeds Gohan in terms of technique. And now he's actually able to go into Kaioken times 100. And once he does, he's actually able to fight Gohan pretty decently. He's clearly made some great progress. All of that training has paid off. Roshi decides, yeah, He's going to train Gohan, and while he's at it, he's going to train Goten as well. Goten has occasionally seen Roshi, but he's going to actually become a more involved student here, especially with Gohan around. This episode is a lot about masters and their students, but now, they're about to see their first fight. After some time passes, one day while they're training Gohan, they notice that Shenron has been summoned, and they were too preoccupied with training to act. Who could have possibly gotten the Dragon Balls? Hopefully whoever summoned Shenron didn't wish for anything bad. Well, that's what happened. Someone did wish for something bad, because back on Frieza Planet 79, where they died, Frieza and Cold have been resurrected. That's right, not just Frieza this time, but Cold is here and he wants his revenge too. They're training, preparing to go to Earth, wanting to get revenge on those Earthlings that raided their place. Inspired by Super Saiyan, Frieza actually gets a new form, which is just Golden Frieza. And as for Cold, I feel like he wouldn't decide to go as flashy as Frieza, because they could choose how their form looks. So he might go for a sleeker appearance, something closer to Frieza in his fourth form or cooler in his final form. And he's pretty proud of it. While with Shin, Vegeta can of course sense this, 
and he knows something bad is obviously happening. Vegeta isn't too worried though. He's found something that might be useful. Good thing he's been watching over the universe so he could be prepared for this. Everyone's different training methods are about to diverge. Frieza, Cold, and their army arrive on Earth, ready to enact their revenge. The first people to arrive are Gohan, Goten, and Roshi, as well as the other members of the Dragon Team, ready to fight. Gohan was actually able to access Super Saiyan God now thanks to some info from Goku, who also ended up accessing it. But Goku isn't here, at least not yet. Hopefully he knows what's happening. And on top of that, Gohan's been able to control Super Saiyan 3 a lot better. Sure, I don't think he'd be able to work around the fundamental flaws of the form, but training with that form actually helped him improve his previous Super Saiyan forms. Since Super Saiyan 3 isn't as easy to control, he's been able to repurpose Super Saiyan 1 and 2, essentially using Super Saiyan 2 as his base form because of how easily he could do it. Well, not while he's at work, but whenever he has free time, he's going to be sitting around in Super Saiyan 2. Although he doubts this will happen, and he knows the form wouldn't be appealing to sit around in, he hopes this will eventually help him gain further control of Super Saiyan 3, so maybe he could use that later on. But always, just in case, he has Super Saiyan God under his belt. But not with perfect mastery. Goten's also gotten stronger as well. He has Super Saiyan 2 and he's actually trying to pursue Super Saiyan 3, thinking that Gohan looks cool while he's using the form. All that aside, they're able to defeat the Frieza Force pretty easily, but now the main course has arrived, Frieza and Cold. They've clearly gotten much stronger. Gohan and Super Saiyan 2, as well as Roshi with a lower multiplier Kaioken, are able to take on the father and son duo while everyone else watches in amazement. No more time for games. Frieza ascends into his gold form, while Cold goes into his final form. And now everyone's starting to get concerned. Gohan decides to go into Super Saiyan God, but he still can't fend off the two of them. And with Roshi and Kaioken times 100, he can't keep this up for too long. Sure, he's able to do it for extended periods of time now with all his training, but it's not like he can keep it on the entire fight. And even with that, it still doesn't seem like enough. Cold and Frieza launch a combined beam, hoping to defeat Gohan and Roshi for good. Their beam connects, and then suddenly, it dissipates. Standing there, with his hand out, is Vegeta, who is currently in his base form? He's actually an ultimate, which he's essentially been using as his base form for now. And everyone's confused at first, but then they realize Vegeta mentioned this before and showed it off. He has this activated 24-7. Frieza and Cold are shocked, and Vegeta's pretty confident. Thankfully, he's unlocked something new. Ultimate might not be enough to take on both of them at once, but he's got something cool up his sleeve, and he notices. Gohan got Super Saiyan God as well. He admires that, but he decides to show off something much better, beyond Super Saiyan God. Of course, he's gotten that form, but he's moved past it already, combining Super Saiyan into it and unlocking Super Saiyan Blue. All the while, Goku's on his way to Earth while Beerus and Whis are taking him. Hopefully, they make it there in time. But it seems like they won't need to. In Blue, Vegeta's actually strong enough now to outpace both of them. Frieza and Cold still haven't refined their new powers and stamina-wise, they're not the best. And because of that now, King Cold is dead. Goku finally ends up arriving on Earth, but the second he does, he sees Vegeta eradicating Frieza, defending Earth. He looks over to Kakarot with a smug grin. It seems his training was the best. But Goku notices that Vegeta is in Super Saiyan Blue, something that he also accessed, and something that he shows off. While Gohan is just amazed to see that both of them somehow got this far, he didn't even think that far ahead. With his limited time to train, he was only focused on his lower forms of Super Saiyan. He didn't even think to combine the power of Super Saiyan into that of Super Saiyan God. He's amazed to see that both of them have gotten this far, and it seems like he has a new goal now. And to test their new power, Goku and Vegeta decide that they're going to have a duel. And plus, there's something else I want to mention. Whis has been watching Earth, trying to see how everyone else is doing with their training, and occasionally he would check in. Sure, Gohan's been doing good and all, even Goten has too. The humans have even made some great progress. But Whis has actually gained a new interest. That guy who used to teach Goku. Roshi, the guy who's now becoming a guardian of Earth. He's showing off some interesting powers and techniques. Sure, Goku showed off Super Saiyan Blue, but Roshi showed off some technique unlike anything else. And Whis has been able to pick up on this ever since Beerus first came to Earth to find the Super Saiyan God. He takes a certain interest in the Turtle Hermit. As Goku and Vegeta prepare for their duel, this is where we'll leave off for now. So in the last part, we left off with a challenge. Vegeta wanted to face Goku again. And naturally, Goku would probably want this. Beerus and Shin would be pretty interested too. They have their own little rivalry going on, and Beerus kind of wants to see if his student is better than Shin's. Shin doesn't really view it that way, but he doesn't want to see how both of them have progressed. Whis thinks this is a great idea, and since Goku is his student, he'll give special treatment, and help them find a place to fight. That settles it then. In a few days, on an unnamed planet, the two will have a duel, with an audience of all their friends. By having it somewhere else, this means they don't have to damage the planet, but they could still go all out if they want to. 
This is no tournament, it's an actual battle. First person to be knocked unconscious is the one who loses. It's been a while since they had an all-out fight like this, and one of the first times they have a duel and they're actually somewhat even. The two pace themselves, starting in base, but obviously, they don't get anywhere by doing this. Goku then jumps to Super Saiyan, while Vegeta turns ultimate, and this catches Goku off guard. He expected Vegeta to go Super Saiyan next, but that's not the case here. Ultimate Vegeta far outpaces Goku in Super Saiyan, even in Super Saiyan 2. He may be in a bit of trouble here. Unlike Gohan, Goku hasn't really had the same training in Super Saiyan 3, so it's not too useful in this battle. So he just goes to the next best step, Super Saiyan God. Vegeta's lost an edge in terms of power, but he's still keeping up somehow. Goku's a bit concerned, this will be an issue. Is Vegeta really that powerful now? Curious, Goku asks Vegeta. They shouldn't play around anymore. Vegeta did want a full power battle after all, so why not just go full power right now? Vegeta's fine with this and agrees. Both of them want to see where the other is in terms of power. So, they both turn blue. This only serves to concern Goku even more, but he chuckles about it. Before the two of them clash, Goku realizes. Vegeta has finally surpassed him. While it's not a crazy gap in power, it's still considerable. And he commends Vegeta for it. It seems Goku really will have to step up his training if he wants to catch up. But he's not going to forfeit. The two have a respectable fight. And while Goku is able to get a few good hits out on Vegeta, ultimately, Goku is the loser in this fight. But this gives Goku a new goal. They'll have another fight sometime in the future, once Goku is stronger. He clearly should take some notes from Vegeta. The two are content and say their goodbyes, but right before Vegeta leaves, Roshi asks something. After seeing Vegeta fight without using Super Saiyan, he wonders, could he possibly obtain the ultimate form as well? Vegeta's a bit amused to hear this. And it's weird, he never really thought about it. Roshi possibly has some huge latent potential, and Vegeta's actually kind of curious about it. So he agrees, and directs Roshi to Elder Kai. While Roshi doesn't want to leave his students for too long, Elder Kai says it's okay. He'll only be gone for a few days at most. And he, Shin, and Kabita are also pretty curious to see what happens. An earthling, doing this godly ritual. It could lead to some pretty interesting results. So, as they leave, they take Roshi with them, with Roshi saying goodbye to Gohan and Goten temporarily. Whis picks up on this and keeps an eye on Roshi. It seems he's pursuing a new method of power. Whis is really interested in this earthling, and he's going to keep up with what Roshi's doing. Since all the Kais are basically Roshi's bosses really high up, he shows insane respect to them. He is a guardian in training after all, and if he is going to become a god, he wants to have a spotless record with them. Not only are the Kais impressed with his power, but with his dedication. He clearly seems like a good fit to be guardian, and he has a clear desire to get stronger. They're even surprised to find out he's over 300 years old. This really is unlike any other earthling they've seen. He's trained up so many other earthlings, and he's even had experience training with the gods. Truly, he's a unique earthling. He definitely is worthy of getting this form, so Elder Kai unlocks his potential. The thing is with Roshi, I feel like he'd have an enormous amount of potential in this scenario. Especially since he'll never die of old age, he can keep training for the rest of his life without worry, which is what builds up so much of that potential. Elder Kai even notes this. He still has so much further to go, and even Vegeta is impressed. Considering Roshi's circumstances and all his training before, if you really want me to give a scale of how strong he is, I'd say he's closing on the level of God Goku and Vegeta. Yeah, that strong. In all honesty, this could even be a low ball. But I don't want to get too crazy. It's just with the insane amount of potential he has, I could definitely see something like this happening. It truly comes as a shock to everyone. Meanwhile, on Beerus' planet, Goku continues working on Super Saiyan Blue. Sure, he does want to surpass Vegeta in raw power, but there's also technique that comes with it. He needs to master this form somehow and go beyond Blue. So he works towards that. And during this time, Shampa shows up trying to get the Super Dragon Ball. Naturally, leading to the Universe 6 vs. 7 tournament. As for the teams, it's going to be a little different this time. Of course, Goku and Vegeta are on there, but the other three members are different. It'll be Roshi, Gohan, and Goten this time. With the latter three more focused on training, and with how much they've grown, of course they're going to be recruited here. So let's briefly cover the tournament. The first matchup is Gohan vs. Batama, and I think it's pretty safe to say Gohan's going to win this one. So next up, he faces Frost, and he's surprised because somehow, he loses. It seems Frost has some weird technique that makes him paralyzed somehow. And it's odd because this guy seems like Universe 6 is Frieza, but he's actually a good guy. Or so they think. But it seems like they'll have to watch out for him because he has some weird strong technique that can paralyze anyone. Roshi faces him next. And the same thing happens to him. Turns out, this wasn't some weird technique. Frost was using poison. He's immediately disqualified. Vegeta doesn't get involved here because that's not who he is in this scenario. So Frost is kicked out, while Gohan and Roshi are given time to recover. Following this, Goten faces Megeta. He's eager to actually fight someone now. With how much training he's got with Roshi and Gohan, 
He feels really confident about this, but he can't seem to injure Megeta in any way. He's saddened by it because he did want to have a good fight with someone, but this guy does not seem to be his match. However, he hears about the weakness of the Metal Men. They just don't like insults. That's perfect for Goten. Easily, I'm sure he'd be able to come up with an insult, which allows him to win. Meaning next, he faces Kaba. Goten's pretty interested to see this. Universe 6 has Saiyans too. As a half Saiyan, this is pretty cool to see, since there's only two Saiyans that he knows of in his universe. Using what he's been taught, he paces himself. In base form, he's fighting Kaba, but it seems he can't match up to his power. The Saiyan must be pretty strong then, and he's having fun with the fight, so he jumps into Super Saiyan. Kaba's just speechless, he doesn't know what this is. And Goten's just confused, he doesn't know Super Saiyan? Kaba's intrigued by this, but there's no way Goten will be able to teach him it. At least not now, so Kaba continues fighting him while Goten's in Super Saiyan. And with Goten and Super Saiyan, this means he far outclasses Kaba. So he wins the fight, and tells Kaba he hopes to see him with Super Saiyan sometime soon. Kaba's just amazed at how strong this kid is. And because of the Super Saiyan form, he'll definitely be trying to pursue it. Finally, Goten faces Hit. And he's getting a little nervous. This Hit guy seems like serious business. And in terms of power, Goten doesn't know how he matches up. Immediately, he goes Super Saiyan 2, knowing he can't mess around here. He tries to attack Hit, but every time, Hit somehow knows how to dodge it. Nothing's working, so he tries a Kamehameha, and Hit doesn't even dodge it, he's just able to tank it. Goten's clearly out of his league, and Hit knows this. Quickly, so quick that Goten doesn't even see it, Hit fires a compressed air blast at Goten, knocking him out of the ring. Next up, Goku faces Hit, eventually being pressured into Super Saiyan Blue, but he's got something new this time. While he did want to get ahead of Vegeta, he did still train with Vegeta before this tournament, and that allowed both of them to access something new. Goku would be the first one to show it off. Against Hit, he goes to perfect its Super Saiyan Blue. And with this, he's actually able to somewhat match Hit better. Even with the time skip, through his pure speed and power, he's able to keep up still. But the thing is, keeping up isn't good enough. He needs to surpass Hit. Although he puts up a good fight, he inevitably loses, as Vegeta goes up next. The good thing is, Vegeta's actually stayed ahead of Goku, and now he also has perfected Super Saiyan Blue. However, it's apparent that the gap between them is closing. It seems Goku is taking up some new forms of training which we'll get to see more of in the next episode. But regardless, Vegeta still remains ahead, and by the skin of his teeth, he's barely able to outpace Hit, which does trip the assassin up, allowing Vegeta to take the win here, securing victory for Universe 7. So it all turned out good, everyone was able to test out their power as well, except for Gohan and Roshi. They kinda did want to fight someone other than Frost, but this is for the better. They're not too concerned about it. But with the Universe 6 tournament done, this means we can hop over to the future timeline. If you remember from a few episodes ago, it's not just future Trunks this time, there's also future Gohan and Goten. And Trunks isn't the same Trunks as before. He's a human, not a hybrid Saiyan. To be honest, I don't really want to waste these guys, so if you do want to see a spin-off video about their timeline, let me know. And I may do it if I find some free time in between the videos. But for them, things have been going pretty good. There were some hiccups, but overall, everything's great right now. And it remains that way. There's no Goku Black, there's no Vegeta Black, Gohan, Trunks, Goten Black, whatever. Everything's surprisingly good. No Zamasu's here, but as for the main timeline Zamasu, let's just say there are some interesting developments. Let's go back to the present timeline. After the Universe 6 tournament, we arrive at a fight between Vegeta and Zamasu. Vegeta surprises the power of this Kai. Right now he's only an ultimate, and he doesn't need the power of Super Saiyan Blue on top of that, but even with ultimate, Zamasu is still somehow keeping up. Although, Vegeta does have a very clear advantage here. He surprises the skill of this Kai, and he wants to finish this fight quickly. The two clash once more, and then, Zamasu concedes. He thanks Vegeta for the training session. Wait, what? Training? Sorry for the little fake out there. But really, right now they're training under Shin and Goasu, wanting to see how their apprentices are progressing. Normally it would be Kabito fighting Zamasu, but Kabito's looking at a promotion to Supreme Kai rather than Apprentice. Yeah, there's gonna be two for Universe 7. I mean, the one isn't really being that effective right now. Jokes aside, Zamasu doesn't actually turn evil here, but it's not that clear cut. He does almost turn evil, but since Vegeta is training under Akai right now, and knowing that Shin and Kabito knew Goasu and Zamasu, it's not unlikely that Vegeta would end up meeting Zamasu as well, and this would be a pretty big change for him. Zamasu does almost turn evil, but he has a discussion with Vegeta and gets to face him a bit. He's able to see through Vegeta. These mortals aren't actually mocking gods. They're trying to obtain a similar power so they can protect their universe. It's a noble cause, and by fighting an apprentice like Vegeta, Zamasu is able to see this. He even hears of Vegeta's story which intrigues him. He learns that mortals can change. Vegeta used to be an evil psychopath, going around destroying stuff and genociding planets. But now, he's training under Akai, trying to better himself and his universe. 
This is a side that Zamasu didn't expect to hear. And yeah, on GodTube, there were some god powers on display during the Universe 6 tournament, but it's not really that big of a deal for Zamasu now. I mean, the three people that were showing godlike abilities, well, one of them's a guardian of a planet called Earth, one of them's training under a Supreme Kai, and the final one is training under an angel and god of destruction. They're all trying to pursue these careers, not mock them in any way. And after all these meetings and sparring sessions, although Vegeta is way ahead, he and Zamasu develop somewhat of a rivalry. Actually becoming friends, it's a really unlikely friendship. But with both as apprentice Kais, they keep in touch. Zamasu is fascinated by Vegeta, and vice versa, and the two enjoy each other's company. Shin, Gowasu, and Kibito are all glad, seeing their students interacting like this. There's no future Trunks arc here. Instead, we'll enter an arc of training, which I'll refer to as the Godhood Saga. Vegeta is not the only one who's keeping up with training, though. Goku still is, and it turns out he's going to have a new classmate. After all this time, Whis finally decides to ask Roshi if he'd like to train under him. Roshi is stunned by this, he never expected it. But Whis explains, he could tell, while Roshi can't rival someone like Goku or Vegeta in power, he's by far the most technical and skilled fighter in Universe 7. Well, at least as far as mortals go, because otherwise that title would belong to Whis. Roshi had hundreds of years of expert martial arts experience and training. He's trained under multiple gods, and his power is really impressive. Whis wants to explore this. He feels that Roshi may be able to access something that he's been searching for in Goku. It's not that Whis is giving up on Goku, it's more so seeing if he could help him somehow. And of course, as for Goku, he's really excited to have Roshi join, although it's odd having him as a fellow student rather than a teacher. It's been so long since he trained with Roshi, and they're glad to be together again. And Roshi assures Goku, as for his sons, they've been making great progress, and Roshi thinks they'll be fine without him by now. Gohan pursues trying to improve Super Saiyan 3, and using his hybrid potential, he's still getting a lot stronger, as well as Goten who's trying to catch up to his brother, idolizing him somewhat. Goku's really glad to hear this, thankful for Roshi's training, and proud of his sons. And for old time's sake, he spars with Roshi, and is surprised to see how strong he is now with his ultimate form. Goku's even forced to go into Super Saiyan God, but even with that, Roshi is still matching him in power. Goku never expected to see this, and is simply just amazed. Roshi can't even begin to put into words how proud he is of Goku. He's happy that Goku turned out this way and lets him know that. If only Grandpa Gohan could see how strong he's become. Really, all of Roshi's students have been impressing him, and he's content right now. It's clear that he did a good job as a teacher. But as for Goku, he can tell he still has a long way to go, and together, they'll achieve higher highs. Goku shares this opinion, and looks forward to getting stronger with his former teacher. They continue training. And one day, Roshi faces off against Goku once again in the sparring match, but this time, they're trying to go all out. The fight eventually leads to Ultimate Roshi vs. God Goku, and Goku has to turn up the heat. He eventually jumps into Super Saiyan Blue, but that's no problem for Roshi. He jumps into Kaioken, trying to deal some damage to Goku. But the thing is, as Goku powers up further, Roshi can't keep powering up with Kaioken. Sure, he can handle it at really high levels, but there's still a certain point that it's going to hurt him too much to do for a long period of time. It's clear he's reaching his limit, and Goku asks if he wants to stop the fight, but Roshi says no. He wants to keep going, trying to focus. He tells Goku, they're not going to end until one of them is unconscious. Goku accepts the challenge, and now, perfected Super Saiyan Blue Goku faces off against Kaioken times 100, Ultimate Roshi. Wow, that's a mouthful. Goku takes those words to heart, continuing and nearly winning the fight. But every time he tries to land a final blow on Roshi, Roshi gets back up. He's surprised at the persistence of his old master. He keeps trying to knock Roshi out, but it won't work and he's no longer going to pull his punches. He throws a final attack at Roshi, a powerful punch. For Roshi, as this happens, it's almost as if time slows, and for some reason, he's quick enough to move out of the way, kind of tripping Goku up. Goku sees that Roshi has a bit more fight and tries to hit him again, but just like before, Roshi dodges. Goku's confused. How is Roshi's speed quick enough for this? He tries harder, but somehow, Roshi keeps dodging, almost like he's not even trying. Whis and Beerus watch as their interest peaks. There's no way. Goku keeps on going, wondering how Roshi is able to do this. Suddenly, Roshi looks up at Goku, as his aura flares up, dodging one of Goku's attacks and being able to get behind him quickly, knocking him down with a single strike. As Goku drops into base form and falls unconscious, he realizes something. In that brief moment, something changed about Roshi. His whole aura, his ki, and though he could barely see it through the sunglasses, Roshi had an odd glow in his eyes. It didn't look like the master he once knew. Goku falls to the ground unconscious, as Roshi looks at himself feeling some sort of amazing change. But alongside Goku, he too collapses, as the flames around him evaporate. Down on the surface, Whis catches them both, and Beerus looks at Whis. Silently, Whis nods, and Beerus grins. A mortal was actually able to do it. 
Although incomplete, Whis confirms that this is what he and Beerus both expected of Roshi. He could tell from Roshi's mind, his fortitude, and his experience that Roshi was sharp enough to a point where he could actually control his movement subconsciously, at least to some extent. Not to mention, his power was more than enough to achieve this. Beerus is very excited. He can't believe it. A mortal may actually obtain the form that he was striving for himself, Ultra Instinct. Following that moment, Roshi then tries to access Ultra Instinct again, with the help of Whis. With how quick Roshi's been adapting to things in the scenario, and with his martial arts mastery, I feel like he would learn this technique pretty quickly. Of course, it's not fully complete yet, but at the very least he can activate Omen at will. And just from unlocking this technique, his latent potential would soar exponentially. So not only does he have UI to make him stronger, but his base will be stronger too due to his potential rising. The ultimate form is one hell of a drug. Beerus and Whis are shocked to see an Earthling grow this strong. Sure, a Saiyan isn't really too surprising due to their race's abilities to grow so rapidly, but an Earthling? Sure, his conditions are unique, and he does have ultimate, but still, they would have never expected a mere human to do this. Goku watches in awe. His master has actually surpassed him, once again having something that Goku doesn't. But Roshi's training obviously isn't complete. He still has a huge goal, achieving the kind of Ultra Instinct that Whis has. Even if he's not able to use it as a permanent thing, he still wants to be able to access it at will. And shockingly, Whis ends up apologizing to Goku. Goku's confused, why is Whis apologizing? Well, he tells Goku, this is a major development and he would prefer to dedicate his time training Roshi specifically. He'll have Goku return eventually, but for now, he just wants to focus on Roshi helping him unlock Ultra Instinct. Goku's kinda bummed to hear this, but he understands. Until, Beerus ends up stepping in. Yeah, Whis won't be available, but Beerus still is. For once, he's gonna stop being so lazy. Goku is his student after all, and he wants him to surpass Vegeta, Shin's student. And what he has for Goku is actually a job offering, one that he recommended before, God of Destruction. And just like before, Goku decides to turn it down. It's not really his kind of thing, but Beerus kind of expected that response. But he persists. He doesn't officially have to make Goku a God of Destruction, just a candidate for now. And by doing so, he'll be able to grant Goku a special power that only Gods of Destruction have. Although, the process is an odd one. He'll be able to train Goku officially as a student now, and he will be granted the ability to access a godly technique. But if he uses this technique, it's permanent. Although, he tells Goku they can always get the Dragon Balls and reverse it if he wants. Goku wonders why Beerus is so persistent about this. And Beerus feigns being generous, but really, it's because he wants to keep ahead of Shin. He'll prove to that Kai that his student is better. Well, as long as there's no obligation and Goku doesn't have to be a god of destruction, he's gonna go for it. Whatever power she's granted, he'll only use for good, and so he could have some more enjoyable fights. Well, that settles it then. Goku is going to be training with Beerus, while Whis will be training Roshi to access Ultra Instinct. This further fuels the rivalry between Beerus and Shin. It's such a weird kind of proxy rivalry, but Beerus has fun fueling it. But of course, things still remain the same with Zeno. He decides he wants to hold a tournament of his own, inspired by the Universe 6 tournament. This one, he'll call the Tournament of Power a battle royale between all of the universes. And now, Universe 7 is tasked with creating a team. The two easy picks are Roshi and Goku, who are basically there by default. But there is one issue. They want to recruit Vegeta, but technically, doesn't he count as a god? Same for Goku since he's technically a god of destruction candidate. They're able to contact the Grand Priest and he gives them some rules. No actual gods can join, so that means real Supreme Kais and real gods of destruction, but apprentices are fair game. This means Goku and Vegeta are allowed to be on the team. Topo was allowed originally anyway, so this would of course slide. It wouldn't really make sense to bar these two in that case. The team is able to recruit 9 people. We have Roshi, Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Goten, Piccolo, Krillin, Tenshinhan, and Yamcha. As for the 10th, Yamcha suggests that they should bring in Trunks, but in all honesty, Trunks isn't really strong enough here. Remember, Trunks is Yamcha's kid. He's a full human, and of course he has been training, but he's just a human kid after all. He's not really going to be doing much in this tournament, as opposed to someone like Goten. They keep thinking, and Goku almost suggests reviving Frieza, but they do have enough power already so it's not worth the risk of reviving him. It's better to get someone from Earth. Vegeta tells Goku, Goten, and Gohan to come with him. He has a great idea. He reveals on his hand, he's wearing a ring. What, did Vegeta get married? He explains, this is a time ring. It allows him to travel through time freely. Interested in what he has planned, the group follows along, as he teleports them all to a future timeline. They ask Vegeta where they are, and he tells them, those future time travelers from before, Gohan, Goten, and Trunks. This is their timeline. They're in a city that's partially rebuilt, but is still progressing by the day. 
This timeline that was once infected with the androids is now safe. It's an odd parallel to their Earth. They head to Capsule Corp first, and they ask to see Bulma. Bulma comes down and is amazed at who she sees, almost crying even. It's Goku, and of course she recognized the other two, Gohan and Goten. The younger version is the people that she already knows. And there's that Vegeta guy wearing some weird outfit. But oh my god, Goku's here. They ask to see Gohan, Goten, and Trunks. And she calls them up, as well as Chi-Chi. It's a nice little reunion, and future Chi-Chi gets to see Goku once more. It's technically not her Goku, but still, it's Goku. So she's happy. The time travelers are glad to see everyone again. Especially with Gohan and Goten seeing their past selves, and vice versa. Vegeta promises next time he'll bring Yamcha and Trunks. But they tell everyone the plan. The group is pretty shocked to hear this. And they then recognize Vegeta's outfit as the same one that Shin was wearing when he came to Earth. They were able to defend against Boo, and Shin stayed alive. And Vegeta explains that he's one of the Kais now. Which is how they're able to travel here without a time machine. They hear about the gods of destruction, Zeno, and the Tournament of Power. It's a lot to take in at once, and they may need to look into it for their own timeline. Especially this Beerus person. But they need to recruit someone. Future Goten and Trunks elect Gohan as he's the strongest of the time travelers. And he accepts, but under one condition. He's amazed to see at how much his past self has grown up and tells him he wants to spar with him right now. That's his condition for joining. Fair enough, present Gohan's up for that. So the two Gohans go to fight all out. Future Gohan goes into Super Saiyan 2, showing off his full power. But Gohan doesn't even go past Super Saiyan. Is he just cocky, or is he really that strong? And the two are fighting pretty evenly despite this, so future Gohan tells him, don't hold back at all. He wants to see how strong his past self has gotten. Gohan appeases this wish, and decides to turn Super Saiyan 3, a form that he now has mastery over. Of course, future Gohan, Goten, and Trunks are all surprised to see this. This power is amazing, as is this form. Gohan explains, it took a lot of time to gain control over, but now, he's able to use it at full strength. Bypassing the key drain. He's been training constantly in this form, and after the tournament, he'll try and teach future Gohan and Goten how to do it. But future Gohan doesn't back down, and Gohan notices. The two clash, with future Gohan defeated in one hit, as Gohan turns back into his base form. Future Gohan is pretty happy and impressed, thanking him for the fight. He lost, but he doesn't care. The person he lost against is himself. Wait, does that mean he's weak, or does that mean his past self is just really strong? The idea boggles his mind. Anywho, the two Gotens want to fight now, but they'll have to save that for later. They're kind of short on time, and they need to get back now. With future Gohan in tow, he says goodbye to everyone, as they bring him back for the tournament. And now, we enter the tournament itself, and everyone gets to meet some of the fighters beforehand. The Gods of Destruction and some Kais are in the arena, giving last-minute coaching to their fighters. And luckily, Zamasu came along. He greets Vegeta, joking that he would wish Vegeta luck, but then that would mean that they may win. But regardless of what happens, the two shake hands. Vegeta is impressed with the Universe 10 team, and Zamasu is impressed with the Universe 7s, but Vegeta notices Universe 10 only has 9 members, and Zamasu reveals that he's the 10th. They heard that Zeno allowed Vegeta on the team, so that means Zamasu is able to join as well, since he's only an apprentice and not a full Kai. Surprising, but not unexpected. The two pals look forward to fighting once more, and the tournament begins. Immediately, Roshi begins to focus. He unleashes his full potential, ready to face everyone. Right now, fighting and just ultimate will be enough for him. And it's the best way to save his stamina. But while he has unleashed his full potential, this isn't his full power, not at all. He actually hasn't really seen Goku in a while, and the two didn't get a chance to train beforehand. So, he's excited to see where each of their training has taken them. The two wish each other luck and fight conservatively for now. Krillin fights alongside Roshi, remembering when they first trained together after Roshi's wish. Roshi's gotten so far, Krillin thinks that they need to train some more. He wants to reach this level one day. Vegeta and Zamasu end up avoiding each other at first, but eventually cross paths as Universe 10's members dwindle, and after they've taken down some fighters. Zamasu knows well that Vegeta exceeds him in power, but Vegeta wants to have a good fight, so he decides to not fight in blue. Zamasu respects this, and the two go at it, even with Zamasu knowing he's not going to win this one. The two clash, enjoying their fight, happy to have met each other as rivals. This may be the end for them, so they want to enjoy it. Zamasu is amazed at what mortals can do, but the two decide they're also going to use Kai techniques in their fight. They teleport around with the Kai Kai, they create blocks of Kachi Kachi and throw it at each other, and they use other magical abilities. It's really a unique fight, but inevitably, Vegeta wins, and Zamasu ends up conceding. He thanks Vegeta for all that he's done, and finally wishes him luck for the tournament, which he hesitated to do beforehand. Considering he's about to be erased, he doesn't mind, he feels pretty content. He knows very well what Vegeta wants to wish for, and he's confident that Vegeta will be the one to win this. Or at least, his team. Shin watches from the stands, understanding the rivalry of these two, happy to see it. 
Vegeta and Zamasu bow at each other, as Zamasu jumps off the edge, no longer able to fight, and with that, Universe 10 is erased, with Zamasu smiling all the way through. Good luck, Vegeta. The two Gohans and Goten stick together, facing the Universe 6 Saiyans, easily winning, and they continue to stick together through this. Goku ends up trying to face Jiren, but Topo ends up stopping him. The two get ready to fight, with Goku easily being able to keep up with Topo in his blue form. Topo is actually having trouble once Goku transforms like this. Goku acknowledges that his training with Beerus has paid off, but Topo notes, something about Goku's key feels so similar to his, and Goku agrees. They both possess godly powers, but of a specific type. Topo then asks, can they fight at their full power? He knows that Goku's holding back, and Goku gets it now, but he declines this. Very well, Topo decides to transform himself, knowing this permanently cements him as a god of destruction. There's no going back now. Goku is still understandably concerned. He knows about the finality of using this power and contemplates it, as he's currently being beaten by Topo. And that Jiren guy, is there any other way for him to defeat Jiren? Goku can't just abandon his ideals like Topo. It would be cool to use this power, but he's concerned. Beerus watches closely. Will Goku go through with it? Topo is about to knock Goku out, telling him that he enjoyed the battle, but Goku isn't God of Destruction material. He wonders why Beerus ever made him a candidate if he doesn't even want to do it. Goku laughs and agrees. He isn't material for this. It isn't his kind of thing. He doesn't want to use this power because he doesn't want to become that. But Topo tells him it's the only way to save his universe, and if Goku doesn't want to use it, then fine. Once again, Goku contemplates it. He knows that Topo is right, and he knows that he can reverse it, but it's just the principle of it. He doesn't want to use this God of Destruction power because that's not who he is. Even though he can eventually reverse it with the Dragon Balls, it's not something he wants to do. But Topo made a great point. It's the best way to help his universe. Topo charges a punch, but suddenly, Goku begins changing. His eyes begin glowing purple, and his blue hair gains a purplish tint from his aura. His muscles bulk up somewhat, and an emblem appears on his chest. Goku's powering up. He tells Topo once again, being a god of destruction isn't his kind of thing, but Beerus granted him this power, so he wants to make use of it. He reveals his own god of destruction mode, and Topo is stunned. If the two of them ever end up as actual gods of destruction, Topo's power pales in comparison to Goku's. Goku will use this power to win the tournament of power, but afterwards, he'll restore himself. Maybe not with a Super Dragon Ball's wish, but later on. He only needs to use it here, right now, just endure it to save Universe 7, as much as he hates the idea of using it. He and Topo fight some more, and Goku inevitably ends up winning. Getting used to this power, he really hopes they're able to reverse this. Sure, the power is amazing, but he doesn't feel right being a god of destruction right now. Beerus grins, looking over to Shin. That's his student. It looks like Beerus takes the win this time. Goku's next target is Jiren. Roshi and Krillin look over to Goku. It's insane, but Roshi chuckles. Oh, that Goku. He's glad that he's not going to keep that God of Destruction power permanently because it's not his kind of thing, but he says Goku should have denied Beerus' training and gone his route. Krillin asks what Roshi is implying, and Roshi just laughs. He'll see soon enough. The two face Dispo right now, with Krillin being hit a lot, but Roshi easily being able to stop him. Dispo tries to outspeed Roshi, but he can't. Roshi, without even using Ultra Instinct, is holding his own right now. Using his Thundershock Surprise, he's able to paralyze Dispo. With Dispo held in place midair, Roshi then drops him off the side. Krillin is stunned to see his master's new power. As for Vegeta, he looks over to Kakarot as well. Once again, Kakarot is above him, but in reality, Vegeta is at advantage, because his power isn't temporary. He knows for sure that Goku's gonna get rid of that power eventually. While Vegeta maintains a power that he can always use, the numbers dwindle as other fighters defeat people. Yamcha, Tenshinhan, and Piccolo are defeated eventually, with Goten and future Gohan slowly falling behind but staying in the ring. Future Gohan is surprised. Goten is actually on his level? Maybe even above it? But they'll have to test that theory later, and right now, they help Gohan eliminate Universe 2. Goku goes to Vegeta, telling him that he plans to defeat Jiren, and he needs to be at his full power for this. He knows the Kais can heal people and tells Vegeta that he needs it. And Vegeta does this. He heals Goku and tells him good luck. He's impressed with Kakarot's power and tells him this, but once he gets rid of it, the two will fight once again to test their limits. Goku agrees, and the two fist bump as Vegeta finishes healing him. The two definitely came far from where they once were. Now in his full power, Goku ends up facing Jiren, actually giving him a challenge here. Jiren is suppressed, but everyone's amazed to see that he's actually getting knocked around by Goku, and Jiren's smart enough to know that it's time to power up. Goku expected this. He knew Jiren wasn't at his full power this whole time. So instead of actually facing Jiren head on, he has a new strategy, utilizing his destruction powers to knock him out of the ring. 
He tries to destroy the ring around Jiren, but it's a little too hard for him. Jiren is very nimble, and Goku wants some of the ring to remain for himself to stand on, so he can't destroy too much. Watching nearby, Vegeta notices and decides to help, and he begins forming more of the ring with his Kai abilities. Meaning Goku can destroy as much as he wants because Vegeta will just create more of the arena beneath him. Goku thanks him as Vegeta sticks behind, creating platforms for Goku to jump on, pelting Jiren with other blocks of Kachi Kachin in the meantime. Jiren is obviously annoyed by this, and he smashes all these blocks, lunging towards Vegeta as Vegeta tries to fight back. But even with Perfected Blue, he can't do much right now, so he decides to teleport away. With the Kai Kai coming in handy, for now he'll stick by the other Universe 7 fighters, supporting them and healing them. As they all slowly finish off the other universes, Goku is strong, but not strong enough because he coaxes Jiren into his full power. And once Jiren fully powers up, he closes this gap that he had with Goku and has actually gone above him. He launches a massive blast to knock Vegeta out first, so Goku doesn't have any healer or supporter. Even though he's advantaged in terms of power against Goku, he knows how valuable of an asset Vegeta is, which is why he swiftly knocks him out before Vegeta can even notice what's happening. He's not worried about the other Universe 7 fighters, as he hasn't really seen much of their abilities, but there's still one person of concern for him, one who he doesn't even acknowledge yet. He's now getting the upper hand on Goku, but suddenly, he receives a kick to the back of his head as he stumbles. Goku's surprised to see, someone intervened. It's Roshi, using Ultra Instinct Omen. Ah, it's this guy. Jiren takes some swings at him, but he can't hit for some reason. He starts using more energy, and this means Roshi's gonna have to get more serious as well. Jiren sees through the facade and knows that Roshi isn't as weak as he seems. This entire time, Roshi was trying to conserve energy, that's why he was using Ultimate and sometimes going to Omen. But of course, this isn't his full power. He tells his students to watch closely. Goku, Gohan, Goten, and Krillin. They all watch as the master of Kame style powers up. This is the final push, so why not go all out? Whis watches happily, knowing what Roshi is about to show off. Beerus isn't too surprised either, but all the other remaining gods, obviously they're pretty shocked. The flames of his aura grow fiercer, as his hair begins to shine. He fully powers up and it's revealed that he now has white hair. Roshi has gained the ability to access Ultra Instinct at will the complete version of it. Although he can access it at will, it's not entirely stable, which is why he wasn't using it this entire time. It's still pretty draining. Beerus is ecstatic. This is awesome. I mean, he knew about it, but this is the first time he's actually seeing Roshi do it. He seemed somewhat uninterested before, but now he's excited. These students are all amazing. Together, Goku and Roshi face Jiren. One alone won't be enough, but the two together, maybe that'll be able to do something. Goku begins destroying the ring as Roshi attacks. He's not focused on the ground beneath him, as his body subconsciously reacts and keeps him in the ring, while he simultaneously attacks Jiren and dodges all of his attacks. Jiren's frustrated, he can't hit Roshi, and even when he tries, Roshi either counters the attack, or Goku comes in and attacks. And when he tries to attack Goku, Roshi then counters that. The two have perfect synergy, he can't defeat them. He gives one last push, but Roshi tells Goku, now's their shot. The two jump up on one of the rocks, planting their feet into it and then launching themselves off the side with the flying kick. As they rapidly descend towards Jiren, he swings at them, but Roshi throws down a blast as a smokescreen and uses the blast to flip over Jiren. As Goku's leg hits Jiren, Jiren's fist hits his face, launching him far away as Goku launches one last blast towards the ground to destroy it. And in the split second, Jiren notices the ground beneath him fading away as it's destroyed. And in that small moment, he's about to jump out, but he's then hit by a kick at the back of the neck from Roshi, with Roshi then jumping off Jiren. Jiren falls into the void, being eliminated more so by technique than power. There still are a couple of fighters in the ring. Krillin, the two Gohans, Goten, and Roshi still remain. And Roshi is declared as the MVP. I mean, obviously. Although Gohan's a pretty close contender. And he tells his students, here's another important lesson for them. Watch carefully. Super Shenron is summoned, and he tells Shenron to revive the other universes. Of course, Roshi's students already know this is the right thing to do, but Roshi just wanted to be kind of cool and act as a teacher in this moment. He's pretty happy about it, that was a great one-liner. And with that, all the universes are restored, and everyone returns home. Future Gohan is then brought home after the tournament, and this time, Vegeta brings Yamcha and Trunks along too. That way, Bulma gets to see Yamcha, and Trunks gets to see the other Trunks. And vice versa for both of those. Everyone gets to meet their future selves once more, with Trunks happy to see Yamcha. You know, seeing this, Vegeta can't help but think. Something about this Trunks and Yamcha thing is weird, but he can't really quite figure out what it is. Future Bulma's pretty happy to see Yamcha again, although it's a bit weird because he's way younger than her, and it really isn't his Bulma that he's talking to. If he shows love to the future version of his wife, does that count as cheating? This moral philosophy stays in Yamcha's mind. Jokes aside, with this, Vegeta's also able to take everyone to meet future Shin, who's surprised to hear that he has a student in the past timeline. 
Shin tells Gohan, Goten, and Trunks about Beerus, and also says, after what they did with Majin Buu, he'd love to help them train sometime, especially if any of them will end up anything like Vegeta. He seems like quite the great Kai student. And with that neatly wrapped up in the future, everyone goes back to the present timeline. Back at home, Chi-Chi scolds Goku for what he did by accepting the job of God of Destruction. Beerus is scared to hear her, but he tells her he could reverse it. He knows Goku doesn't want it, and worst case scenario, they wait a year for the Super Dragon Balls. Or maybe even Shenron on Earth can grant it. Maybe he can find a way to remove it himself, or Whis. But on second thought, Chi-Chi thinks it's kinda cool and cute. Goku a god. Also, it's a second job for him. But Goku says he doesn't get paid for it, and then she tells him that they're gonna stick with farming in that case. But Vegeta consults Goku. Before Goku removes that power, he does actually want to test himself against Goku's power. At least while he has it. The two students are pumped, and Shin and Beerus agree at the fight. They'll prove which of their students is better, with the two bickering ready to prove the other one wrong, as they teleport to the world of Kai's for a fight. Naturally, Goku would end up winning this one due to his power, but since Goku doesn't want to be considered a god and he has the power removed eventually, Vegeta has an upper hand so he's still happy about it. Goku does promise he'll get ahead again someday. Back on Earth, Roshi returns to Kami once more, with Gohan and Goten, and Kami is glad to see his students. Roshi has made excellent progress, and Kami decides. It finally may be the time to officially pass their torch to Roshi. He asks Roshi if he's sure about it, since he could do things way more interesting than guarding Earth, but Roshi is happy to accept. Earth is his home, and he wants to protect it, and besides, with all the fights he's involved in, he already is protecting Earth indirectly. He is sure about it, so Kami makes it official. Roshi is now the guardian of Earth. Gohan and Goten watch, happy to see their teacher promoted, but Kami has two requests. For one, they first need to gather the Dragon Balls, and wish for Roshi to have the ability to create them. They're kind of weirded out by this, Kami's still gonna be there, can't he just do that? Well, not quite, he'll explain later. They make the wish, and now Roshi can create Dragon Balls. But now Kami reveals his other request. He's fulfilled his role, and asks Roshi, bring Piccolo up to the lookout. It's finally time. Piccolo knows why he's being called up there, as Kami told him telepathically. Roshi is confused and Kami says, Long ago, he was once united with King Piccolo, but Kami had to split with him so he could become Guardian of Earth. That's why King Piccolo, his other half, was so evil. But now that he's no longer Guardian, this does seem to be the right move. Wait, what's Kami referring to? Well, he explains. He's gonna merge into Piccolo once more, wanting to reform his cell from the past. Kami is too old now, and he's been replaced. He's served his purpose and he's proud of his work. He'll either end up dying of old age, or he could do this, so this option is much better. He promises the students that it'll be okay. As Roshi and Popo tearfully watch as Kami says goodbye, fusing into Piccolo, reuniting once more as they were hundreds of years ago. Roshi tries not to cry as his master says farewell, but he can't help it once his master is gone. Kami's taught him and shown him so much. But Piccolo then walks up to Roshi, placing his hand on his shoulder. Kami will live on within him, as he is a new person now. He tells Roshi, thank you, and wishes him best of luck as guardian. Because of him, Kami and Piccolo can finally be whole again. His master isn't there physically, and in terms of personality, it is still mostly Piccolo. But Piccolo assures him, Kami will spiritually live on through him, the nameless Namekian. Roshi wipes his tears and laughs, thanking Kami for all that he's done. This is for the better. Kami will live on for longer through Piccolo, and his spirit continues through Roshi. It's not the end. It's a new beginning. And with the two Namekians now reunited, and Roshi as Earth's guardian, this is a fitting place to finally end the scenario. Sorry that this part was a bit long, there was a lot to fit in here, and I didn't really want to split it up into two. But hopefully, you enjoyed this scenario and this conclusion. Let me know any of your thoughts and suggestions down below. And thank you for supporting me all the way through this. I really like doing this scenario, and I'm glad I got to do one about Roshi for once. If you liked the video, be sure to drop a like. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe, as well as hitting the bell icon to get notified about any future videos that I upload on my channel. Thank you all for watching, thanks for supporting this scenario, and I'll see you all in my next video.